It's often said that the devil will find work for idle hands to do, but who is there to find some fun things for those idle hands to do when the devil's work is over for the day, say about 5.30, 6 o'clock, something like that? <laughs> well, it's me and Rich here on Fist of Fun. Fist of Fun. Fist of Fun. It's the new lifestyle show with something for everyone. From youngsters who like the fast music, swearing and obscure cultural references, <laughs> to the very old who like the flashing lights and the bright, moving colours of my show. <laughs> That's right, and if, uh, if you're part of that mid-1990s generation who feel disgusted, disenfranchised and disenchanted with the hollow vacuum of modern life, and if you haven't got any hobbies, then Fist of Fun <laughs> is the show for you. Cheer up, Stu. It's great us being on the telly, isn't it? Yeah. You never guess what? Earlier on, I saw Jeremy Paxman in the lift. <laughs> yeah. Really rich, yeah. yeah. I was as close to him as I am to you now. I leant over and touched his briefcase with one of my hands. <laughs> and he never saw. <laughs> so what? Jeremy Paxman, Stu, off of the telly. Yeah, but you're on the telly now, aren't you, Rich, right? This is the telly. Everyone here is off the telly. If everyone here walked around going, oh, look, it's that bloke off the telly, no one would get anything done, would they? <laughs> Jeremy Paxman, though, Stu. <laughs> off of Newsnight, you know. Hello and welcome to Newsnight. <laughs> Here's your star yeah, no, for no, ten. No, 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 that's the... No, no, no. that's his papers yeah. he's doing there on the yeah. desk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the no, news, I'm Joe. <laughs> Remember, uh, this is... Uh, the news your... tonight I'll leave is... It now, okay. <laughs> this is your show, right? We want to hear about what you like to do in your spare time. You're the stars and this is very much your... <laughs> this is very much your show. Uh, although it is me and Rich that get all the money for doing it, obviously, and not, <laughs> not you. We get it. <laughs> this. Hello. My name is Simon Quinlag, and this is my hobby spot, where I suggest the kind of hobby which anyone looking for a hobby might find to be an interesting hobby. What you will need for this week's hobby? A telephone, a clock, a tape recorder and or pen and paper, a flask of weak lemon drink, and a voice. <laughs> this hobby is a good hobby for anyone who likes collecting things and has a keen interest in facts and figures. Especially if this interest is primarily about leaves, and more specifically, their size. Now, this hobby is also a good hobby for anyone who doesn't like to ever leave the house, ever. This week's hobby is called ringing Norris McWhirter at three o'clock in the morning and asking him what the biggest leaf is. <laughs> what do you need to do? First, find out the phone number of Norris McWhirter, star of Record Breakers and Keen Anti-Freedom Campaigner. Then, wait until 3 a.m. Uh, you can drink your weak lemon drink now. <laughs> you can save it until later. Five, four, Bees, three, the tiny two, shoes. One. Leave me alone. <laughs> At 3 a.m. exactly, ring the number. Remember to ask the permission of whoever pays the phone bill or to do it secretly without telling them. <laughs> it's ringing. When Norris McWhorter replies, say this sentence with your mouth. Hello, Doris McWhorter, what is the biggest leaf? <laughs> Answer me! <laughs> <laughs> then make a written or intaped message of Norris McWhorter's response. Do this four or five hundred times and you will have an archive of 3 a.m. Biggest Leaf Inquiry Norris McWhorter responses which you can show or play to your friends or to interested members of the public. My favourite one is, leave me alone, please leave me alone. Why are you doing this? Why? <laughs> To do this hobby, you must ring Norris McWhorter at three o'clock in the morning exactly and then ask him what the biggest leaf is. No other combination is acceptable! <laughs> Bye! Fans. So, Stu, uh, what have you been up to this week that the folks at home there might like to try? Well, this week I've been trying to create false certainties in my life by organising everything I own into alphabetical order on this shelf. Uh, there's a B, Buddha, C, Coconut Chimp, H, Hardback Books there that I've read. 
And um, a lot of people have said to me that doing this kind of thing is the work of an obsessive and dysfunctional man. And uh, these are the people that have said that. There they are. <laughs> and these strings indicate the exact location of their homes. <laughs> Mr. Fun. Erupts with eye-filling excitement. One of the things we've been thinking about this week is sex. And there's nothing funny or rude or embarrassing about sex, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to discuss it in a mature and grown-up way. Nice! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there is a reason, isn't there? Uh, I forgot it's you, isn't it, Rich? Yeah. yeah. I know all about sex, Stu. And I saw a bear lady once. Mm. <laughs> it was in a magazine, but it still counts. But I haven't had a serious relationship partner for about three years now, for some reason. Yeah, it's, uh, it's weird, that, isn't it, Rich? Because mayflies, for example, right, they only have three hours in between hatching and dying in which to find a mate. And yet they always succeed, don't they, right? So if a small, unpleasant fly can manage to form a successful relationship in an eighth of a day, you'd think you could have managed it in 27 years, wouldn't you? <laughs> Very funny, Steve. You see, the thing is, I am more choosy than a fly, aren't I? <laughs> I'd never try and get off with a fly, for a start. <laughs> well, not unless I was really drunk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Stuart, you badgered me into it with your questions, questions, questions. <laughs> I did once get off with a fly at New Year. <laughs> and it was quite good, actually, cos a gnat's chuff... <laughs> ..is literally as tight as a gnat's chuff. <laughs> Yeah, Rich, but uh, that's because a gnat's chuff, right, is literally a gnat's chuff, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> so what you've done there, OK, is you've misunderstood the art of simile, right? <laughs> you've confused being like something, right, with being the same as something, <laughs> with actually being the thing that it is, haven't you? Yes, I have, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've decided it's time to do something about it and see if I can find a real relationship partner rather than this string of stupid slack gnats I've been hanging around with. <laughs> so last month I went out to see if there's an easy way to meet human girls. Richard. Well, let's check your details one more time, shall we? You've listed your interests as football, curry, fruit machines, video games, chips, Monty Python sketches, <laughs> drinking beer and women's wrestling. That's right. Those are all of my interests. <laughs> right. Well, we've fed the data in. Let's set the computer running. <laughs> Well, less than an hour has gone by, and I've just been told that not only has the computer come up with a match, but my perfect partner is on the way up to meet me now. Well, Richard, here's your perfect partner, Alan Stevens. <laughs> hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, but Alan is a man. Yes. To be perfectly honest, Richard, there aren't any women with similar interests to you. <laughs> nor indeed to any men at all. Quite frankly, I find it's better to put people of the same sex together. They have more in common. And Alan Stevens here does like all the same things as you. Sure do. <laughs> uh, no offence, Alan, it's just I was hoping for a woman. No. So was I. There you are, you see. That's another thing you've got in common. <laughs> um, so, um, rich. Do you, do you fancy coming down the amusement arcades in Soho? Hmm? Well, you know, um... <clears throat> Come on, there's nothing funny about it. <laughs> All right, then. Nice. 
Well, <laughs> there you go. It's a terrific night out. Well, Thanks absolutely very brilliant. much. No yeah. problem, mate. Yeah. Hey, it's a shame there wasn't anywhere else on. Yeah, yeah, I can have another <laughs> ooh, two pints two at least. Two pints. Okay. Yeah. 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 Welcome to the tube room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh, well. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, yeah. Um, I suppose I better shake you by the hand yeah, a big and shake uh, there, but <laughs> give you good All night. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to come in for coffee? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, Rich, uh, what happened next there? That is between me and Alan, Stu. Oh, yeah. There's nothing funny about it. If all men live with men and all women live with women, I think we'd have a much better society. Well, only if I can watch, Rich. <laughs> well? It's a very clever plan, sir. I wish it were. But, you know, Stu, it was great going out with Alan, cos uh, whenever I've taken girls out on dates like that, you know, down the arcades and porn cinemas and stuff, they've, uh, they've never wanted to see me again, you know. I'll, I'll never understand it, Stu. What is it that women want? Well, Rich, I think, uh, in your case, what women want is someone else, isn't it, really? <laughs> Personally, though, I like my women like I like my coffee in a cup. <laughs> well, we all know someone, don't we, who uh, we don't really like, but who follows us around all the time, trying to copy us and just basically trying to be us. Well, for me and Stu, that person is Peter. He's Welsh, but he now lives in Balham in South London. And he's Britain's top lifestyle expert. Will you please welcome Peter? <laughs> Did you like that, Stu? I sort of hid behind the table and jumped up. It was like you in your crates, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like Wayne Sleep would have done, Pete. It was really good. <laughs> Hello, I'm Peter, and uh, I've got a lot of exciting lifestyle ideas that I thought up with my brother Charlie. Uh, the ideas are for absolutely everybody, but I suppose especially the young, single, Welsh Balham man virgin... <laughs> ..of 31. <laughs> and Charlie, who's 37. <laughs> By the way, if you want to try some of these ideas, we have put them in a book idea, which we based on Delia Smith's One Is Fun cookery book. Ours is called One Is Quite Lonely, <laughs> which we think is more honest in the end, really. Anyway, on with the fun and a delicious recipe. And this is a lovely cooling snack for the summer. For this, you need a piece of frozen chicken and a fork. <laughs> Take the chicken out of its tray like this. <laughs> Don't throw these away, by the way. They're ideal as sort of very small skips to put your rubbish in. <laughs> <laughs> then take the fork, push it in the chicken. Chicken lollies. <laughs> <laughs> That's especially delicious with a cigarette, by the way. <laughs> Anyway, next, I'd like to give you a nice personal grooming hint. Are your teeth all horrible and rotten and yellow like mine? <laughs> Why not paint them with Tippex? <laughs> now, occasionally, I do spend time on my own all the time. So, over the years, I've worked out lots and lots of ways of how to have fun on your own. Here are a couple you might like to try. Number one, easy time travel. Lie on the floor, close your eyes, and when you wake up, you'll have travelled into the future by a few hours. <laughs> I haven't worked out a way to get back yet. <laughs> and finally, have fun in your head with words. For example, there's a van parked on my road, and on the side of it is the word rentacrates. And when I see it, I imagine it says rentacrates. <laughs> Some sort of ancient Greek man lives inside the van. <laughs> That's my favourite. <laughs> OK, time for my last recipe. This is my fridge, by the way. There you go. <laughs> Hello, Paul. It's my mouse, Paul. He lives uh, under a chop. <laughs> right, for this, you get a bit of white bread, which you push in your mouth, like this. Don't swallow it, though. Just push it down into your jowls like a hamster would. Then do the same with some red jam. <laughs> Custard cream. <laughs> and finally, a great big swig of sherry. <laughs> Instant trifle. <laughs> Fist.
Over the next few weeks, what we want you to do is uh, send us anything that you might think we'll find sort of amusing or interesting in any way. Uh, could be something you've drawn or made or something you've cut out of a magazine or perhaps something you've found in a plastic bag in a wood. <laughs> We've collected together some stuff to give you some ideas, so come with us now, sit back, relax and enjoy... The, the Gallery. gallery. <laughs> These are some football stickers that I ripped up when I was 19 uh, in 1987. I've rearranged the names of the players there, like he's become Craig, Greg, Nigel, just made that one up. Uh, Colin McTringy. Brian Clough I've left as he was there. Um, <laughs> also, that was my idea, so don't copy it. <laughs> Here's uh, top chef Michael Barry off of the telly and some of the food he's uh, prepared over his glorious career. What I like is his smiling, curmudgeonly Cornish face. <laughs> this is a photograph that I stole off the wall of the Red Lodge Transport Cafe near Norwich. Uh, it's a photograph of a singing old man. <laughs> and on the back of this... <laughs> on the back of this, Matthew has written... Here is a picture of a hilarious arse. <laughs> He's right about that, Stu, isn't he? Certainly <laughs> This is uh, Ian Humphreys here. If you haven't yet spoken to Ian Humphreys, <laughs> he can be found at the Midland Bank in Western Supermare. Um, either look up the number in the telephone directory, ring directory inquiries, or go and see him yourself. And uh, however cross he gets, he will like you to talk to him. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we can't return any of your pictures. Because at the end of the series, we're going to screw them all up and throw them in a big burning bin. <laughs> Especially if it looks like you spent some time and trouble doing them. <laughs> but there will be a special I Like Fist of Fun badge, which I have made, <laughs> for any that we show. Look at that. Not your day, is it, Peter? Still, it's no use blaming them. You, uh, you look a bit sad, Rich. What's the matter? Nothing, shit. Nothing. Come on, you can tell me. I'm your friend. Come on. Oh, it's all right. I've just been reading this magazine that Rod, Hull and Emu have split up. Mm. <laughs> you like them as well, don't you? Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not worried about Emu, you know, he's got a good act. That'll work with anyone, you know, on his own. <laughs> it's Rod that... Rod, Rod Hull. Rod Hull, yeah, he worries yeah. me, cos, you know, without or Emu, all he is is a shrieking ginger-haired bloke <laughs> lunging towards small boys' genitals with his bare hand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not funny in this day and not age, now. is it? <laughs> would have been all right in the 50s. Yeah, it would have been, been good then. It would have been a top act, yeah. you know. <laughs> Stu, what was that thing flashing up then, just then? That, Rich, was part of this show's hidden agenda to establish you and me as gods of a new world order through the use of subliminal flash frame imagery. No, Stu, because if it's a hidden agenda, you've just... <laughs> <laughs> you've just fought it, haven't you, by telling everyone that it's there? Ah! No, cool. no, no, because that's the thing about hidden agendas, Rich, right? They have to be partly visible, otherwise there's no point in having them, is there? See? Oh, yeah. I always think an agenda's a bit more sexy if it's partially hidden. Anyway, perhaps... <laughs> perhaps slightly draped in a piece of silk. No. <laughs> what you've done there, Rich, right, is you've confused an agenda, yeah, with Julia Sawala from Press Gang, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have, you're right, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> seems a bit mad, this god idea, though. You know, it took the Greek gods, for example, hundreds of years to become established. Yeah, I know, but they didn't have their own half-hour show on BBC Two, did they? <laughs> I still think you're rushing it, Stu. Remember the story of the tortoise and the hare? Yeah, I do remember that story, actually, Rich, but I fail to see what relevance the story of a tortoise being faster than a hare has to, has to us, right? You know, it's all very well to know that in exceptional circumstances a small reptile might be faster than a fast mammal, but, you know, <laughs> can you imagine any situation in which that information might have the slightest relevance? Well, I think it's just like I was saying... No! Got... It's time for me to redress the balance. <laughs> Stuart Lee's True Fables. This week... The tortoise and the man. <laughs> Once upon a time, when the world was young and the fairy folk still walked the land, there lived a tortoise. <laughs> and a man. Hello. <laughs> now, the man was jealous of the contented tortoise. Hey, you! Tortoise! I'm much better than you, you know. I am. <laughs> I'll prove it. I'll race you up to that old gnarled oak tree up there. <laughs> That'll settle it, and we'll hear no more about it, all right? But the tortoise remained serene, for he was wise and noble, 
and because he was a tortoise and therefore did not understand English. <laughs> All too soon, an exciting day came. Get set. The man ran off as fast as his two legs would carry him, but the tortoise did not move a jot. Being only a reptile, it had little or no concept of competitive sports. <laughs> Three hours later, and the man was in sight at the end of the race. Phew! I'm miles ahead. Ah, oh, just up here for a breather. <laughs> Hey, hey, look, lads, it's the man. Hey. Right. right. Ian. Right. Oh, Graham, a, a pint of Forex if you're getting them, mate. But just the one, I'm involved in a running race with a tortoise. A tortoise, the man? You should win that easily. The tortoise is a notoriously slow creature. Yeah, that's what I thought. Time passed. <laughs> All right, oh. who wants another? Oh, jeez, yeah. oh, look at the time. I've got to go. The tortoise. <laughs> Every time it's his round, eh? Same bloody excuse. <laughs> Outside, the man looked up the road to the end of the race, and there, crossing the finishing line, what did he see? Nothing. <laughs> As I explained before, the tortoise had failed to grasp that the man, or even the race, actually existed at all. Have you been listening to what I've been saying, or what? Am I just wasting my time? <laughs> With his last ounce of strength, the heroic man pushed his weary body over the finishing line. One! I beat that stupid tortoise. I am <laughs> I am best than it. <laughs> <laughs> The story of the tortoise and the man there. And the moral of that story is that if a man were to race against a tortoise, a man would win. <laughs> right? Uh, one little tip, though. If you do turn a tortoise upside down on its back, it will just die anyway, like that. <laughs> Mr Fun. He'll kill everyone. We've got to start now! Anyway, uh, what have you been up to this week, Rich, that our viewers at home might like to try? Well, Stu, I have been shoplifting. Oh, yeah. Um... <laughs> It's fantastic for three major reasons. One, you get a fantastic adrenaline rush as you're running away from the shop. <laughs> Two, it's a cry for help. <laughs> and three, it's best, most importantly, probably, it's a great way to get free stuff. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> over here are just uh, three of the things I've shoplifted today. Look at that. Right, so that's uh, a biro yeah. there, a Kinder Egg. Yep. And a copy of Men of Achievement 1974, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> a bit of an impulse one, that one, really, right. but uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, incidentally, uh, Kinder Eggs are very good to steal because they're very small, they're very easy to palm off in the palm of your hand like that. No one would know it's there, very natural. Plus, no shopkeeper's going to be expecting a 27-year-old man to want to steal one, is he? So, uh, <laughs> element of surprise there. That, that's pathetic, that. It really is pathetic, that is. No, it isn't, Stu. You don't understand what I'm doing. By shoplifting, I'm disobeying the rules of this so-called land. I am like the modern-day Dukes of Hazard. I am. <laughs> I'm like my hero, the controversial Kill the Police rapper, Ice-T. Nah, nah. <laughs> I don't think that uh, you and Ice-T are really comparable, are you, Rich? Let's look at the facts, right? Ice-T is a lean, black freedom fighter from the riot-torn streets of the urban war that is South Central Los Angeles. Yeah. And you're a small, fat, white, middle-class bloke from Cheddar in Somerset, aren't you? <laughs> In fact, your dad is an ex-headmaster, isn't he, called Keith? Yeah. Who's got his own caravan, isn't he? Right? <laughs> Look, there's, uh, there's Ice T there, right? There. With a gun, yeah? Yeah. And there's you with a Kinder Egg. It's different, isn't it? <laughs> do you think Ice T's dad's got a caravan, do you? Might have. He hasn't, I'm telling you. Do you think, do you think he's called Keith? Keith T? <laughs> I don't know, might that, be. That your mum on the end there in a one piece? <laughs> with a gun? Yeah, might be. Cheddar in Somerset is a very violent place, Stu. In 1982, a mod from Weston ran a mock up the gorge. What, on his own? Yeah. Right. He threw a table at my friend Brian Bancroft in the Cantonese takeaway. I mean, if that had hit him, it could have left a scar or something. My friends and Cheddar are the new unemployed, unemployable underclass of Britain today. Yeah, Rich, but that's because your friends in Cheddar still think that electricity is the magic of the Wookiee Hole Witch, don't they? <laughs> Very funny, Stu. Today in Somerset, electricity arouses only suspicion. <laughs> Not fear, actually. It's weird. I mean, you shoplifting, that is really pathetic. I mean, you're a highly educated man, aren't you? 
You are. Yeah. It just goes to show that, like, university education, you know, it can't teach you the basics you need to know about common sense in real life, can it? Ah. But it can, Stu. What do you mean, ah? Ah. <laughs> A momentous day for 18-year-old Jill Edmonds as she begins three years of study at Britain's most famous university. A university that boasts more graduates than all other universities in the world put together. The University of Life. <laughs> During your years here, you will learn many things. Basic car maintenance, <laughs> how to look after yourselves in a fight, <laughs> what birds really want, <laughs> worsening unemployment and inner city decay. Who is to blame? Well, of course, it's the bloody immigrants. <laughs> like it's not as simple as that. Immigrants to any culture, a small percentage of the social underclass, and thus a convenient scapegoat. For... I can see you have a lot to learn, young man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, plenty of time for that later. Meanwhile, go out and have some fun. <laughs> but soon the fun and excitement must end and hard work begin. In this essay, I should be arguing that all art is shit. Especially the stuff where you can't even see what it's supposed to be. The sources I've used are Fiesta, The Daily Mail, Chubby Brown's UFO video, and ah. I should be quoting extensively from the arguments of Steve Wright and his posse. Their analysis of contemporary events is very thorough. Especially the girl one. Year two, and Jill gains a place in one of the University of Life's most popular and prestigious schools. <laughs> out of life, Jill. I want to run my own independent film production company. Ow! Oh, never happened. Get a f***ing grip. Oh, <laughs> You're right. I want to work at Starburger and Hammersmith like all my friends. Excellent. You're working very well this term now, Jill. Thank you, sir. Not really. <laughs> Final exams at the University of Life concentrate more on practical than written tests of knowledge. Open the term no money in there! I liked your opening, it was clear and concise. The search let you down. Even in small shots, you must expect the shopkeeper to be tooled up. Any sign of trouble, you shoot, shoot to kill. Either in the face or the chest, as I explained in my lecture last week. I can only give you two, two, I'm afraid. Oh, just get me to the hospital. My dear girl, that is the very first place the Rosos will look. <laughs> so I shall have to take it out with this rusty knife, I'm afraid. And as Jill leaves her home of three years, she is older, wiser, and qualified for adult life. I've learned that life isn't fair. The common sense is more important than reading fancy books. But most importantly, I've learned that all students are wankers. <laughs> well, that's just about the end of the show. Uh, just remains to thank Peter for his lovely recipes. Thanks, Pete. Do you want Oi! To get back. Anyway, uh, next week I'm going to be talking to you about how my own tragic and ultimately fatal addiction to various forms of Class A drugs has helped me to overcome my previous dependence on born-again Christianity. <laughs> and I will be talking to two men who became trapped overnight in a ball-bearing factory. They got out all right in the morning when the security guard came round, so it was fine. No worries there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's time for us to get back in our crates until next week, getting back in crates. What, we have to stay in these crates until yeah. next week, do we? Yeah, that's right. What, do all TV stars have to do Yeah, that? they have to do that, yeah. What, yeah. Moira Stewart? Yeah, Moira Stewart as well, oh, yeah. I mean... Thanks a lot, and see you next week. Bye! Bye.
fist of fun. Fist, fun. Fist of fun. Welcome your hosts and do it Thanks, do it There's loads of plates in here. <laughs> plates. <laughs> we know, where's Rich? <laughs> On a shelf or something. I'm Stuart Lee. And I'm called Richard Herring. Hey! And this is Fist of Fun. Fist of Fun. 29 minutes and 15 seconds of impractical suggestions of ways to fill up those long, empty hours between your birth and your inevitable death. <laughs> What's the matter? It's you, isn't it? <laughs> Stuart Lee, off of the telly. <laughs> I saw you on the telly last Tuesday. Rich, you've seen me in your house every day for the last nine years. You weren't on the telly then, though, were you? <laughs> Hello, I'm Stuart Lee. That's your captain. <laughs> you confused a thing with another thing. That's what you say. You, you sign your name on my arm. Um, it's, it's not for me, it's my nephew. <laughs> you're, you know, you're on the telly now, aren't you? Ah, you recognise me. <laughs> I'm famous. <laughs> did, did, you, did you see our photo in the last week's Radio Times? Look, there it is. My mum held it up. She's a teacher. She held it up in her class at Blackford Middle School in Somerset. And the children were all very impressed. Yes, Rich, but uh, those children were from Somerset, weren't they? Wouldn't have seen her a photograph before. <laughs> They'd have been impressed if your mother had held up any brightly coloured object in front of them. <laughs> Especially if she'd moved it slowly from side to side, as if it were a flying spectre. <laughs> very funny, Stu. The days when people of Somerset believed that cameras were magicians that could capture their souls on a piece of paper are long gone now. <laughs> Apart from in Shipham, mm. where... You know, <laughs> It doesn't matter, though, because there's nothing to photograph there, is there, anyway? Well, there's the War Memorial. That's nice, nice, isn't it, the yeah. War Memorial? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Pete, all right? You done anything interesting this week? Oh, yeah, I, I found a new stain on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like sort of space, but with some, like, hair. <laughs> Fist of fun. How much junk can you take? You know, even top TV celebrities need hobbies to fill up their spare time. Like Bill Oddie here, star of The Goodies. He is a keen bird watcher. There he is. Bill likes nothing more than hiding in bushes in the countryside and spying with binoculars on tiny birds who have no idea that their every movement is being watched, noted down and secretly enjoyed. <laughs> when the birds go out, Bill likes to go in and leave them anonymous threatening messages and obscene drawings of them that he has done himself. <laughs> then he quickly hides again and eagerly waits excitedly for the moment when the birds will come back and you can look at their confused bird faces. <laughs> very flustered he by it all, doesn't he? Very hot under the collar. <laughs> but you don't have to travel out into the countryside and be a perverted ex-member of the goodies to enjoy looking at wildlife. <laughs> the barren concrete city. Against all odds, home to an unlikely cavalcade of wild creatures. The urban fox, the urban badger, the urban hedgehog and the urban man. Ever since our cities started expanding into the countryside, the phenomena of urban man has been with us. These unusual creatures eke out an existence in our barren concrete jungle, living on what we humans discard. <laughs> the earliest recorded reference to urban man comes from the village of Hoxton in Suffolk in 1642, in the journal of Dr. Jemmy Smith. The natural man appeared in the winter of that year. He walked naked upon God's earth with nay hose nor jerkin, nor hat upon his stranger. <laughs> and yet he hath a pouch of skin or fur, in which his codlings do conceal themselves outside the mating season. <laughs> Urban man is adapted and can live anywhere from outhouses to sewers. Our man is lucky to have a cosy den beneath the foundations of this suburban house. To urban man, a deserted garden is a fabulous adventure playground. <laughs> oh, 
we love having them in the garden. They're, they're very shy. They come right up to the glass, though. <laughs> they're cleaner than a lot of people we know, too. <laughs> Sometimes I could add a saucer of milk or some lager and some crisps. Oh, but they're very choosy, though. They won't drink Kestrel. <laughs> Look. Yeah, they come now, wanting for the supper. Look. <laughs> This one's a funny one with a funny little nose. <laughs> John, Paul, George yes, and Ringo. Ringo. <laughs> oh, they're John. sweet. <laughs> Though seemingly carefree, urban man's life is full of hidden dangers. <laughs> While to city dwellers the urban men may seem a charming reminder of the natural world, to the country population, they are little more than a pest. A lot of highly imaginative people, some neurotic, some just plain liars. This week, I've been unable to sleep because every time I close my eyes, I'm chased through a maze by giant rats with the faces of all the other comedians on TV. So, <laughs> I've been out most nights driving round and round the Elephant and Castle roundabout in South London in my buff, metallic 1973 Hillman Avenger, shouting out of the open window, Damn you, damn you to hell, Patrick Marber. <laughs> And uh, last week I got pulled over by the police and they just messed me around for about two hours. And I don't know why that was at all. <laughs> I wonder what that could have all been about, Stuart. It's terrible, isn't it? I don't know, pigs, pigs messing Pigs, oh, yeah, that's yeah, terrible. Yeah. Do you think it was something you said or did, maybe? No, nothing, no. Do you really? You think so? Yeah. I think it probably was something you said, Stu. And uh, to prove it, I want to recreate exactly what happened that night. Yeah. Over here, come with me. Fun. Right, so here's uh, the, uh, this is the Elephant and Castle, Stu. I painted that myself. That's nice, my, that's it? my car good. there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I hope you don't mind, I brought it along. We need right. it for the reconstruction, right? Oh, okay, yeah. And all, we, all else we need for the reconstruction is, of course, the very police officer who stopped you that night. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome PC Andy Rothery? <laughs> Give him a round of applause. OK, guys, what I want you to do is to recreate the exact conversation you really had. This is a genuine conversation, Stu. And if I think you've made some kind of mistake in your dealings with PC Rothery here, I'll ring on this buzzer. <laughs> like that, you see? Right. So if you get in the car... <laughs> it's a bit like something Chris Evans would do, isn't it? It's good. <laughs> something from his ginger imagination. Imagine that. <laughs> OK, so let's uh, try the recreation now. Let's go. Do you mind stepping out the car, please? Yeah, sure. Is this your car, sir? Yeah. Have you been drinking tonight, sir? No. Do you take drugs at all? Sir? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, can anybody here spot the mistake that Stuart Lee may have made in his dealings with the police there? What would you do if a policeman asked if you took drugs? What would you say? No. See, most people would say no. Would you... What do you think, officer? I would have preferred that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I do take drugs, don't I? You know, just the occasional puff on a funny cigarette, admittedly, Mum. But, um, you know... <laughs> I'm in my mid-twenties, right? You know, I'm driving a rubbish car, I've got an earring and funny hair, and I work in TV, of course I take drugs, don't I? You know? <laughs> you don't need a certificate from the Hendon Police Training College to work that out, do you? The point is, Stu, you shouldn't be honest with the police. Right. <laughs> it confuses them, OK? OK? <laughs> anyway, carry on. So you take drugs then, sir? Uh, yeah, I do, but I haven't got any on me tonight, so there's no point searching me. Uh, right, right now, what? <laughs> what do you think's going to happen if you tell a policeman you do take drugs, but he doesn't need to bother searching you tonight for some reason? Come on. Um, is it... Uh, think, Lee, um, think! Is it, uh, it's uh, that I'd let you go. What is it, what? It's because that I would let you go. Right, OK. Uh, go. Uh, uh, is it that he'd let me go? No! <laughs> 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 He's going to have to search you now, isn't he? Obviously, you idiot. Sorry, carry on. Uh, carry on. Are we some kind of comedian, sir? Uh, yes, I am. That's very astute of you, officer. <laughs> I'm a stand-up comedian. That's the kind of comedian that I am. Now you're being sarcastic to a oh, policeman. Well, I just answered the... You said it in a sarcastic way. Mm. There's nothing that the police hate more than sarcasm. Not even crime. <laughs> Rodney King was sarcastic to the police. Do you know what happened to him? He wasn't. He was. He went, you never get me. Uh. <laughs> you don't what see that on the video, do you? You don't see no. it on the video, but it's there. So, what you're saying, right, is yeah. that, you know, I shouldn't be honest to the police, yeah? 
Yeah, we'll listen to somebody and we don't expect it and we don't like it. Right. <laughs> Uh, PC Rothery for coming on and making Stu look like the idiot he really is. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Could I uh, just make an important announcement? Please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if there are any children watching tonight, uh, if anyone is to come up to you in the street and offer you drugs, just say no. And come and get them off me down at the station. I've got some <laughs> really, really good ones. Just ask for Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Just for fun. It makes me mad with power. My wife's just bought one of those new dishwasher machines. You just pop your dirty plates in, and then you set it running, and very soon your dirty plates are clean. And that's a bit like Jesus, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> Next vicar, please. <laughs> I am reminded of the words of St. Simon the Appellate. Thank you. We'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> People often say to me, Father? God does not exist. But I say unto them, Ah, no, but he does. Thank you. <laughs> he really does exist, you see. He is as real as the day. Thank, Thank you. Leave now, please. Terry, Terry He's go. very good. He, he is... <laughs> When we witness a tragedy such as has occurred in Shrewsbury this weekend, we as Christians look unto the heavens and cry, How could you let this happen, O God? I thought you loved us and created us to do your work. I think we found our vicar. <laughs> that we can become closer to our God. Today has been a good day. Fist of fun. Destroying mine. This. Well, there's been a lot of fun and laughter up to now, hasn't there? But there comes a time for the laughter to end and the misery and pain to begin. <laughs> So, will you please welcome the Welsh misfit and top lifestyle expert, Peter? Oh, hello there. Uh, I'm Peter again. <laughs> and I'm back with more exciting lifestyle ideas for the young single 31 year old stinking Ballam Virgin <laughs> who likes the James Wales show. <laughs> I'd like to start with a recipe, and this is a, like a nice easy one for after, say, a hard day sort of lying on your side with the curtains closed, <laughs> looking at the back of an empty record sleeve that you found in a hedge. <laughs> and you're too tired to do anything complicated like uh, toast. <laughs> well, what you do with this is you get a bag of twiglets and open them. <laughs> Little hint here, try to have your nose really close up to the bag when you do this, because they always give off a nice sort of burp. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try that with dry roast peanuts, mine. <laughs> You'll be sick. <laughs> anyway, what you do is get a twiggler out of the bag, bite each end off it, <laughs> and get a glass of milk, and use the twiggler like a straw <laughs> to soak milk out of the glass. <laughs> then eat the twiggler. That recipe's called Milk Sucked Through Twiglets, which you then eat. <laughs> right. Do you have trouble getting out of bed first thing in the afternoon? <laughs> Drink a bottle of Tabasco sauce. <laughs> now, this brings me to my main bit, because, of course, the most important reason for being awake during the day is so you can do your job, isn't it? Why not make an office for yourself to work in? This is an old broken child's typewriter here. <laughs> You can get these from the cancer research shop in Ballam High Road last July. <laughs> what you do is stick a bit of string to the back of the typewriter and push the other end in the back of the telly. Put it to CFAX. <laughs> Word processor. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Unfortunately, you can only really type stuff like Scottish weather view or uh, <laughs> Middle East flight bargains. <laughs> However, if you want to print stuff up, what I usually do is get a bit of paper and copy the words off the screen. <laughs> then I push it in this sort of toilet paper dispenser thing here. <laughs> Press print. <laughs> Scottish weather view. <laughs> Right, I'd like to finish with a delicious alcohol recipe, and this is for a special occasion, such as you've been outside. <laughs> it's called Budget Beer Punch. For this, you need some beer and the plastic bowl from next to the toilet. <laughs> Take out the old razor, the bit of dental floss and the lump of hard, scrunched-up tissue. <laughs> Pour the beer in the bowl and drink it. <laughs> You can actually add extra fruitiness to that by holding a bar of lemon zest soap in your hand <laughs> and smelling it while you drink the beer. <laughs> or putting some strawberry lip balm on your lips. <laughs> and uh, thanks for all the amusing and strange and odd things and items that you've sent in. So please come with us as we pay this week's visit to... The gallery. <laughs> this is a picture of Queen guitarist Brian May, <laughs> and it's made entirely out of sweets. What do you think? Uh, what do you think Brian May is thinking about there, Rich? I think he's thinking about what Anita Dobson's going to make him for his tea tonight. Could be. It's Bill Oddie there, the bird fancier. <laughs> This is a leaflet uh, for Barometer World, which is a tourist attraction you might like to visit. It's in Merton in the West Country, unsurprisingly. And uh, it says here, normally one or two cars can be parked in front of the showroom entrance. <laughs> so don't all rush at once, then. And Emma sent us this dirt-covered scratched photo, which she found on the floor in Wales. And um, if this is yours, write in and we'll send it back to you. <laughs> You're like the modern-day bagpuss, you are. I am, yeah. I like their little Welsh hats they've got there, though. I, I dislike those, actually. <laughs> and this is David Attenborough from Off of the Telly. And, look, he's standing beneath a Timothy Spoll tree. That's a... Uh, <laughs> Timothy Spoll's face. Which continent do you think that tree would grow in, Rich? I think that would grow in the continent we call imagination. Mm. <laughs> do, uh, do keep sending your stuff in, though, as well as all the uh, religious, mad and threatening stuff you send in unsolicited all the time. <laughs> and uh, the best and worst of those will be displayed here in the gallery. And everyone who gets their thing showed will be the proud owner of an I Like Fist of Fun bag. <laughs> <laughs> It's fun! You've got so many Easter eggs this year, Rich, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's great. I just told the woman who works on the show we need them for an important joke. And look, hoot, pla, hale, here they are. It's <laughs> great, isn't it? You know, some people say chocolate's a substitute for sex to you. I disagree. For me, sex is just a way to take my mind off chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> for a couple of seconds, you know, and then... Uh, <laughs> back into it again. But, uh, you know, it's important to remember, you know, Easter isn't just a time for eating far too much chocolate stew. It is mainly that, but it's also a time <laughs> to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus, which is why it would be selfish of me to eat all these Easter eggs myself. And that is why I'm going to give this one here to someone who maybe deserves a bit more. Maybe they're a bit sad, lonely. They don't have any friends of their own, you know, to give them an Easter egg. What do you think, Pete? Would that be a good idea? Yeah, has you got buttons? Yeah, they're your favourite, aren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah thank you very much. That's why I'm going to give it to this old lady in the audience over here. Here we go. Oh. There you are, that's for you. Oh, thank you. Even though it's mine, I want you to have it, all right? Oh, thank you. Sorry, you don't have to get me one back. You can have it, it's yours, all right? Oh, it's not bad. Do you see, Stu, do you see how good I am? Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah, I did, yeah. So, so what about you? Have you... Have you got any uh, Easter gifts for the disadvantaged in our audience tonight, Stu? No. That is because you are a selfish, unchristian curmudgeon, Stu. <laughs> when I needed a neighbour, were you there? Were you there? <laughs> no, I wasn't there. I was hungry and thirsty, Stu. Were you there? <laughs> were you there? <laughs> no. I was cold. I was naked. Were you there? <laughs> were you there? On that occasion, I was there, yes, Rich, obviously. <laughs> You know, I did apologise to you at the time. You said you'd forget about it, let the matter drop. You know, just leave it. <laughs> it's left a deep psychological scar, Stu. It was, it was very cold that night. But I know, know, I was there. Right? I know. I just leave it now. Just forget about it. I was naked, I know, Stu. You were, I know. <laughs> Bare-ass 
necklace. I know. You could see my monkey ass and everything. I know you could, right? <laughs> but, you know, you're no better than me. I am. You aren't, I right? Am. You only gave that egg to that old woman in the safe knowledge that you'd be rewarded tenfold at a later date. That's what you think. No. It is. <laughs> it is. The whole idea of Christian charity is a hypocrisy of the first water, as my special Easter week parable will now demonstrate. <laughs> Stuart Lee's special parable. Once there was a charitable and holy man. He lived in a fine house, but his door was always open to the poor, and he considered himself a good Christian. One day... What can this be? <laughs> Dear friend, I have been observing your goodness for some time, and tonight, as a reward, I will come and visit you. Be ready for me, and you, in turn, will be welcome in my father's house on high. Yours sincerely, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> Hallelujah! How blessed am I! <laughs> the man laid out his finest linen, prepared a sumptuous feast, and made up a bed in the spare room. <laughs> at seven o'clock exactly, there came a knock at the door. Ah! Oh, that'll be Jesus! <laughs> Help me! I'm an old, bent woman, old and bent, and I need a place to rest my old bent body. Look, Normally, I'd welcome in even the oldest and bentest bent old woman. <laughs> Tonight, I'm expecting a very important guest. I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, the holy lamb at last. Oh, hello, G. Sorry to trouble you. I'm a small, bald man. <laughs> my hairless head offers little protection against the freezing night. I'm sorry. Normally, you'd be welcome into my house, and I'd offer you milk and a choice for my excellent selection of wigs. Ooh. But tonight, I'm expecting a very special guest, and sheer practicality dictates that numbers must be limited. And he shut the door in the bald man's shivering face. Hello. I'm a menstruating woman. <laughs> I'm shunned from my village due to religious laws. Could I...? <laughs> Hello. I am the elephant man. <laughs> Surely this must be the enchanted saviour prince. <laughs> Hello, I'm Annabelle Giles from Television's Riders. And hit the road. Shh. And these are some of my unfortunate friends. We're cold and hungry. Will you please let us in? I'm sorry, Annabelle, but tonight I'm expecting a visitor of splendour and I cannot allow you to enter. Aww. And with that, Annabelle Giles led her world-weary companions off into the wintry night. about you, Jesus. I went to all this trouble for you and you never came. Ah, but I did come. Well, you didn't. I'm telling you, I was in all night. Ah, but I did. <laughs> you did not recognise me when I called. Remember the old bent woman? That was me. Ah. What? And the bald man. That was me also. What, and even Annabelle Giles? No, that was actually Annabelle Giles. <laughs> Help me. Annabelle does a lot of work for the disenfranchised. Well, what was the point of all that? Do you not see? Well, no, I don't see, actually. Ah. I mean, well, all I can see is that, for some reason, you've deliberately wasted an evening of my time. Oh, <laughs> poor fool. Have you learned nothing? Well, yeah, I've learned something. I've learned that, you know, you think it's funny to dress up as sick, <laughs> ill people and mess other people about. No. Ah. Ah. No, what do you mean, ah? ah. No, not ah. ah. No. <laughs> You're obviously trying to make me look like some kind of hypocrite. Ah. No, not R. Shut up with your R. But the fact is, right, I do. As you know, I do do a lot of work for the poor. Yeah, right? So why don't you just go and pick on someone who doesn't do any at all? Ah. Oh, not R, right? You know, I went to all this trouble here for you because you said you were coming round. Not in disguise. You. Ah. No. Ah. No. Not R, right? And all this food that I did, right, that's all wasted now. It's got, like, maggots in it and stuff. You know, and I could have given that to the poor or something. Ah. Not R. Yes, not... but do you see? No, do you see? <laughs> you, Jesus, eh? <laughs> Speak up, Jesus. I didn't hear you. Yes, I said yes. And so Jesus went on his way. Don't come back! 
himself to ashamed, but secretly pleased with his knight's mischief and planning what holy trick he would be playing on some unsuspecting Christian who was trying hard to live a good life. Blessed be the Lord. Amen. A bit of a personal view of that power. Well, that bloke looked a bit like you in it, I thought. Yeah, it was. It was, it was funny, though, wasn't it? Well, I wonder if you'll be laughing so hard when you're burning in the fiery lakes of hell with devils pouring napalm on your nose. Well, um, I won't be laughing so hard, Rich, but uh, I will still be laughing a bit. <laughs> Ooh, fuck. You'll see an amazing succession of staggering scenes. Well, that's just about the end of this week's show. Have you enjoyed being on the old Idiot's Lantern again this week, Steve? Well, not really, no, Rich. I mean, showbiz and TV may look very glamorous to ignorant outsiders, but the fact is that being a stand-up comedian is the loneliest job in the world. No, it isn't. What about a lighthouse keeper or Terry Waite when he was working as a hostage in Beirut? <laughs> no, that's not as lonely as this. Being a comedian is as lonely as a cloud. Right. I think, Stu, what you've done there is you've confused being on your own, yeah. right, alone, with being with hundreds of other people all hanging on your every word, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, I have. <laughs> the loneliest job in the world was believed to have been this one. John Tracy, who Mr Tracy sent into outer space to monitor all Earth's broadcasts, because that couldn't be done from Earth, obviously, for some reason. <laughs> But, in fact, the loneliest job belonged to John's deformed brother, Ian Tracy, <laughs> who the family kept hidden from the world in a locked cupboard under the stairs, or Thunderbird 11, as Ian was told it was called. <laughs> you see, Stu, Ian Tracy. That's the loneliest job in the world, not a comedian. Right. But, uh, comedy... <laughs> Comedy is great for meeting people, especially girls, because comedy, Stu, is a bitch magnet. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, polarity of your bitch magnet appears to have been reversed, doesn't it, Rich? <laughs> Perhaps it was dropped or left in a strong electromagnetic field. <laughs> or maybe some little kid put it in the science lab without its protective cover on it and it got horrible. <laughs> Lots of horrible iron filings all over it. <laughs> now no one wants to touch it. It's yeah. got all, like, stuff coming off yeah, it. Yeah, all right. You got any uh, advice about meeting girls, Pete? Uh, well, are they, like, with the eyes on their chests? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I haven't. No. <laughs> Uh, right, well, that just about wraps it up uh, for uh, this uh, week's excuse show. Excuse me, oh, Richard. I know you didn't want anything in return, but I was so taken with your charity earlier that I went out and got this Easter egg for you. Oh, wow, thanks. Look, I've been rewarded tenfold, just like I want... I mean, even though that wasn't why I did it or anything, it was just... Uh... <laughs> Stu, you get nothing. <laughs> when I didn't have an Easter egg, were you there? Were you there? <laughs> no, you weren't there. No, I wasn't there. <laughs> Richard was there for me. And he will be welcome in my father's home on high. Oh, is your dad still alive? He must be ancient by now. <laughs> it's, it's you, isn't it? Ah. S Stu! <laughs> Stu, it's Jesus! It's Jesus. He's come in disguise to test you. He has. He's not. It's right. Jesus! Get in your... Stu, yeah. you're in trouble. He wouldn't come Apologise for that oh, thing you did about him. You'll get in gonna... trouble. Oh, no. He'll get you, Stu. Get back in your crate till next week. Well, all right. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
your host, Stuart Lee. Oh, nice begin from Paul Fiction. Nice begin. He shouldn't be there, Dane. Right in, Van Hyten, that's what he wants. Rick should be in there, not in. That's Quentin Tarantino's gimp. Are we going spare? That's it, where's Rich? Second week running has been a mistake. I'm Stuart Lee. And my name is Richard Herring. You never guess where I just was, Stu. No. Oh, dear. Yeah. Anyway, uh, welcome to Fist. <laughs> Welcome to Fist of Fun. Oh dear. Yeah. Ooh. It's the uh, the lifestyle show that aims to find at least one thing for everyone in the world to do, irrespective of their age, race, creed, colour, or pain threshold. That's right. But remember, it does all come from the perspective of two emotionally stunted men in their mid twenties, yeah. who've never done a decent day's work in their lives, <laughs> and who rarely venture out of their houses for fear of missing an unscheduled episode of Going for Gold. <laughs> <laughs> Got into a bit of trouble after last week's did. show, didn't you? Yeah, Steve? yeah. Yep. In response to the Easter parable, uh, we were deluged with nearly two letters of complaint. This one is from Mrs. J. Wentall. Uh, she wrote to me to say, The show displays a woeful ignorance of true Christian belief. <laughs> I wonder if you dare to broadcast something in the same vein, but targeting a travesty of the Islamic faith. <laughs> and I wrote back to Mrs. Wentall and I said, Well, no, I wouldn't. Uh, you know, might be an atheist, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> the old fresh air, don't you, Yeah, Steve? yeah, and uh, having my hands as well, like them. On the end of your arms, yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. useful. No, actually, what I was referring to was the 50 letters of complaint we received about your continuing anti-Somerset prejudice. Yeah. Look, there's just some of them, look. Yeah, it's really amazing, actually, getting 50 letters of complaint well, from it's Somerset. It's impressive. Because, of course, they've only got the one quill pen between them, down, <laughs> And that's chiefly used for tickling the devils out of the mad folk, isn't it? <laughs> So, as you well know, in Somerset today, the mentally ill are treated with modern electric shock therapy. Mm. <laughs> and where electricity isn't available, say, in Shipham, they're, you know, smothered humanely. Okay. All right. <laughs> but, uh, good news, Rich. Good news for you and your socially dysfunctional county folk. Because one of the things we're going to be looking at in this week's show is how to make friends. Fist. Hello, you must Hello, be Doris. Eden, Jenny. Doris Hi. lent me. Hello. Hello. Hello, welcome. Come on in. So nice to meet you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Hi. Come on through. Make yourselves at home. <laughs> right, that's my husband, Ken. <laughs> uh, this is Sarah and Hello. Jeremy. Hi. And that's Roger. Hi. He lives at the wood end of the road. <laughs> I am enchanted. <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> have a bit of a do when you folks move in. <laughs> Just so everyone can get to know you, see who you are, find out a little bit about you, <laughs> so you feel like one of the uh, family. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ian, um, you work in the personnel department at Lucas Alternators, don't you? Yes, that's right, yes. I've been there for about... Four, four years! years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, Ian, we've done our research. Yes. <laughs> Jenny, I gather that you hail from Lincoln and that when you were 14 you won a bronze Duke of Edinburgh award. Yeah. How do you know that? It's in the newsletter. <laughs> when new people move into the road, Doris and I do like to put together a little newsletter about them. Just things anyone can find out from records at the local library and a few phone calls posing as a government official. <laughs> I hope you don't mind just being neighbourly. <laughs> Here's your soup, Ian. Sorry? Come on, Ian, you love soup, don't you? You have two or three cans a week. You're soup crazy. <laughs> You've taken the liberty of going through the bins in your old house in the car. <laughs> Just to get some idea of your uh, interests. <laughs> so, come on then, Mr. Soup, eat up. So, Jenny, I understand when you were younger you had an operation to remove a bottle which had become trapped in your anal passage. <laughs> Roger here works as an orderly at the local hospital. Yes. So, as you can imagine, it's very easy for him to slip into the records room under the cloak of night and find all sorts of hoopla halay. <laughs> it's best to get these things out in the open now, Jenny. It stops gossip and rumour mongering. <laughs> oh, time for my film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are, Jenny. Buying Ian some more soup, I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> oh, 
Is, is that another bottle? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, that's you again, Jenny. And although this is only a shadow, I think it gives us all a fair impression of what you might look like, Bear. There's her bra. <laughs> you were on that toilet for 25 minutes, Ian. I thought I was going to get cramped up in that ventilation duct. I don't know what was going on here, Jenny. I don't think that's Ian, is it? No, Still, no. Still, we mustn't pry into what doesn't concern us. <laughs> and that's the end of my welcome, Ian and Jenny, to Ringfield Road. Oh. Oh. oh, dear. Hope it wasn't anything we said. I think we're quick. We should be able to catch the rest of it on the closed circuit. <laughs> What do you mean it's not oh, a <laughs> good fun. It's in there. It's horrible. This is a photo of me, uh, age seven, uh, at Widney Junior School with all my, my tiny friends at the time. That's me, there. Um, that kid was uh, Scott uh, Harris. He was rich, so everyone liked him. Uh, <laughs> Andrew something there. He, he actually changed my name from Stuart Lee to Poo Art Wee. <laughs> Which was very funny at the time, as you can imagine. <laughs> that kid there, uh, can't actually remember him. Um, something, no, can't remember him, has gone. When uh, I was at school, Stu, you know, Steve Cheek, my friend, used to, we used to go up the gorge together, drink woodpecker cider and shout at girls. It was great. He said to me, these were perfect days and we would be friends forever. But, you know, now whenever I ring him up and ask him if he wants to go up the gorge and mess around like yeah. we used to, he says, Rich. I am the Professor of English Literature at Bristol University. <laughs> I have children of my own now. Leave me alone. Stop ringing me. You're strange. <laughs> That's really sad. You'll come up the gorge with me after the show, won't you? Drink yeah. side after the show, yeah? yeah? I will. Yeah, Yay! Drink one, of the, uh, one of the problems that you have with side making friends, yeah. as we've seen, is that ultimately, of course, you will outgrow side them and become embarrassed by them. Uh, I am a cider drinker. Yeah. We've been in a situation where we're at an important showbiz party and uh, you're talking perhaps to, say, Mark Lamar and uh, getting on very well with him on a one-to-one -one basis, you know. And then your embarrassing friend comes along and he goes, Oh, you're that Mark Lamar off the telly, I've seen you. I've touched your hair with one of my hands. Are you talking about me, Stu? <laughs> no, I'm not, no. Cos, you know, if, if you are, I, I won't come to the showbiz parties with you anymore if that's the way you feel, you know. I'd... Actually, I, I don't want to come. I just thought I don't want to come anymore. I didn't Rich, like them. You know, no, you, no, you I don't want to go. You don't mean that. You know I do. Like, <laughs> you know what you're like? What? You are like the Edwardian explorer, Captain Oates, you are. <laughs> what do you mean? Ah. No, you can't <laughs> just go <laughs> up. What do you mean? Ah. Don't just go up. What does he mean? Fist. I'm... I'm just stepping outside. I may be some time. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I, I said I'm just stepping outside. That's very brave of you, Captain Oates. Thank you. Th that's all right, Captain Scott. Um, uh, bye then. Bye. 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 <laughs> you realise it's it's really cold out here. If I stay out just a couple of minutes, I'll probably die and everything. If that's what you want, it's fine by us. So you're not going to try and stop me, then? No, not if that's what you want. Bye, then. <laughs> um, I left my glove. Oh, thank you. What do you want, Captain Oates? Do you want us to say you're the best at going to the South Pole? Is that it? No, it's all right. It's not that anyway. I'm just going, all right? Yes. <laughs> Twat. <laughs> Um, I'm back. Uh, it didn't take as long as I anticipated uh, the thing I had to do. Oh, oh Captain Oates! Actually, I've had a really bad week this week, cos uh, my flat has become infested with mice. I am a vegetarian, like Morrissey and Hitler, and <laughs> so I can't condone the murder of small animals, you know. Surely there's more important things to worry about, Rich, than whether you should kill some small rodents. I mean, you know, what about the homeless, for example? Oh, no, Stu, I don't think we should kill them. <laughs> not 
doing any real harm. Although, admittedly, if, uh, if a homeless person was scurrying around my kitchen, stealing my cheese and going to the toilet all over my work surfaces, <laughs> I might consider putting down some kind of humane trap, but until that day, be fair, Stu, yeah, live and let you, live. You're, you're like Pol Pot or you're someone. Not, not, you you're are. Not, you're not You've missed the point. That's not what I meant at well, all. Well, it is, it actually. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it would all be OK if the mice were dead, but I didn't have their blood on my conscience. So you can imagine my delight when last Friday it seemed all my prayers had been answered. It happened just a little bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Damn you mice! S stop eating my food! <laughs> you know you're only taking advantage of my misguided middle-class liberalism. <laughs> if only you were dead and some kind of metaphysical conceit could take from me the responsibility for your death. <laughs> oh, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> Blimey! It's the Pied Piper of Hamlin. That's right, Rich. You may know me by my gaily coloured cloak. I'll get rid of your mice, no problem. With my magic pipe. You better come in. But won't I still be to blame for their fate? No, 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 Rich, no. Legally and morally, the minute I begin to play this pipe, the mice are my responsibility. Let's say they should be horribly killed. It would be my fault, not yours. Then you will be blameless. Well, you wouldn't, would you? Shut up, Stu. You weren't even there. Get out. <laughs> but I must be well rewarded for this sacrifice. I require a bag of gold. Will you take a check? Yeah, right. <laughs> P-I-E-D. <laughs> Smash it. Let the mouse holocaust commence. <laughs> Hooray! The mice are dead and I'm not to blame. Hooray! I mean, how sad. <laughs> so, what you're saying is the Pied Piper of Hamelin, right, he came from 13th century German fiction <laughs> right through to 20th century clap and reality, right, just to rid you of those mice. Yeah. That's lucky, wasn't it? It was nice of him. Well, not entirely, Stu, because on the very next day... Oh, <laughs> oh hello again, Pied Piper. What's up? That bully check you gave me asked him bounce, didn't it? That's not my fault. You didn't ask to see my check card, did you? And anyway, a bag of gold isn't legal tender in 20th century Britain. Don't you even know that yet? Damn your eyes! This sort of thing's always happening to me. Check <laughs> on, Pied Piper. You am a twat. Oh, that's what you think. Ah, well, I can do more things with this pipe than enchant a mouse. Go on, then. Steal away all the children in King's Avenue. I don't care. Oh, and this time, make sure you wait for any lame children. This isn't the 13th century anymore, and there must be proper wheelchair access to whatever <laughs> mystical land you lead them away to. Rich, my revenge is sweeter. What do you mean? No! What are you doing? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it was awful, Stu. Now, every time I make a smell, the pipe plays and enchanted mice try to get into my trousers. <laughs> I think uh, Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys is interested in uh, buying that pipe off you. <laughs> because he collects unusual musical instruments. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Hello. If you have seen me before, then I will need no introduction, as you will recognise my face. If, however, this is the first time you have seen me, then I must tell you now that I am called Simon Quinlack, and the thing I shall be telling you about is a hobby you might like to try. What you will need for this week's hobby? Lots of thin white paper, some charcoal, or crayons, a guide to country churches, a flask of weak lemon drink, and at least one hand. <laughs> if you are going to country churches and rubbing things, then this is the hobby for you. This week's hobby is called arse rubbing. Here's how you do this week's hobby. First, find a church 
and then go to the vicarage. <laughs> you can drink your weak lower drink now, or you can save it until later. When the vicar answers the door, talk to him for a while about God and architecture. <laughs> Hello, vicar. I like God and architecture. Do you? Then say this sentence with your mouth. Mmm, that's very interesting, reverend. Would you be interested in letting me take a charcoal or crayon rubbing of your arse? Answer me! Oh. I'm delighted. Remove the vicar's trousers and underpants if he has them. Place the paper over his arse and then rub the edge of the charcoal or crayon against the vicar's arse. <laughs> and then, hey, Preston, a perfect charcoal or crayon representation of the arse of the vicar in charcoal or crayon has appeared on the sheet in charcoal or crayon. I would use charcoal, but crayon is much better because it is in colour. I label the rubbing with the date, church, name and cleanliness of the vicar. If you are a Muslim or a Hindu or a Jew, why not make an arse rubbing of whatever the blokes who run your religion are called? And remember, grabbing and stripping a vicar and making an impression of his arse against his will is against the law and is punishable by a ten-pound fine. Careful. Although vicars may appear to be friendly with strong moral and religious convictions, almost half of them are evil and perverted. So, if they ask me to rub on anything other than their arse, I lightly decline and then call the police. <laughs> That's my hobby. I like it a lot. And I think it's better than brass rubbing, because brass rubbing is the same every time you rub them. Whilst, over a period of years, a vicar's arse will change in subtle ways that are almost imperceptible to the human eye, but which will become apparent when you look at the rubbing or rubbings. Plus, if you are gay or a woman, it's a good way to get a look at loads of blokes' asses really easy. <laughs> Touch them. I am not gay, though. <laughs> or a woman. Bye. Fun. Yeah, that was, uh, that's Kenneth Smith. He got me in trouble, actually. He made me do a dare where I had to pull down my pants and he didn't do it and I did, and, you know, and, um... <laughs> and that kid, I, I still can't remember. I think I knew him because we used to hang around together because we both got picked on. I got picked on for looking a bit Chinese. <laughs> and, uh, he used to get picked on for something about his face. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> dance, dance, where well, now it's time to meet our regular lifestyle contributor. He was born in Wales, but in 1979 he packed his plastic as the shopping bag and came to see what he could make of himself in the big city of Balham. <laughs> and all he could make of himself was this. Please welcome Peter. Come Sorry. on, Peter, get up. You're wasting time getting there. Sorry. Uh, hello. Um... They were talking about friendship, weren't they? <laughs> it's a funny thing, friendship. Like, sometimes, one minute you feel you haven't got a friend in the world, the next, you're wandering around the street on your own, staring into space and sort of banging into things. <laughs> and you still haven't got any friends. <laughs> anyway, I'm back with lots more exciting lifestyle recipes and ideas that I thought up with my brother Charlie to liven up those horrible, dull bits of the day when you're awake. <laughs> For example, why not try this fun holiday recipe? Go and get the cutlery drawer from the kitchen. <laughs> fill all the compartments with curry. <laughs> then pretend you're on a plane. <laughs> by sitting with the drawer on your lap by the window. Sort of looking out and imagining that all the white-haired old men going past outside are clouds. <laughs> My main bit this week is called Fun with Drugs. Unfortunately, real drugs are expensive and some of them make you die or feel hot. <laughs> so I've worked out some ways you can simulate their effects, but at a fraction of the cost. <laughs> Number one, give yourself the massive confidence that some drugs give you by going and looking at something that you know you're better than. <laughs> I usually use this piece of dirt here. <laughs> or a spider. <laughs> you have to be careful with the spider, though, in case he starts doing something that he's better at than you, like making webs or crawling up the side of a bath or <laughs> having eight legs. <laughs> you could always retaliate by going... <laughs> which spiders can't do. <laughs> Number two, get the effect of cannabis by sitting in a hot bath, smoking a cigarette, then standing up really suddenly in the bath. <laughs> Finally, go into the Bedford pub on Bedford Hill in Balham, walk up to the huge frightening man 
who lives in the bed sit next to mine and who once came in my room at three o'clock in the morning and tried to put a pair of handcuffs on me and touch my face. <laughs> and do a spit in his beer. <laughs> this should create the common drug effect of having to be rushed suddenly to hospital very close to the point of death. <laughs> right, I'll finish with another nice recipe. Uh, for this, you need a pint of milk, which you put in a natural, electricity-free fridge like mine. <laughs> Twiddles in pants there. Put some milk in there for about three months. <laughs> I think that's ready. Then get a biscuit. And what you do is smear some jam on the biscuit. I'm using my hand for this. <laughs> Finally, pour the three-month-old milk onto the biscuit. <laughs> Three months cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> Good, isn't it, Pete? He's always yeah, he's goes good, down very yeah. well. It's very yeah. popular. He's proving isn't it. I, I could have done lifestyle things like that, you know, well, been easy. If you want to do that, you can do it another time. No, I don't, I don't want to do oh, it. You now. Do it I could have, no, I could have done it, but I don't. I don't really want to. Anyway, you know, let him do it. <laughs> Captain Oates, you are. I'm not like Captain no, Oates. Captain I'm not. Would you like the last roast potato, Mrs. Neal? Oh, thank you, Captain Oates. Lovely. I mean, I know you've already had four roast potatoes, <laughs> and I've only had none, but don't let that worry you. Fine. I mean, I'm not really hungry anyway. If you want the potato, just say now before I eat it, Captain Oates. No, no. You have it. If you really want another potato, uh, Captain Oates, you, you can have one of mine. I have two. Well, I don't want it off your plate with your spit all over it, do I? <laughs> anyway, I don't want one. No potatoes was enough for me. <laughs> if you really wanted another potato, you should have said, instead of offering it to Mrs. Neal and expecting her to realise that when you did so, you did not really want her to have it to Captain Oates. I didn't want it, Captain Scott. All right. If you want it, just say. No, you stuff it in your greedy face. <laughs> you want the food that I paid for. Fine. If that's what you want, I'll eat it. All right? Oh, all right, I will have it if you insist. Uh, can you pass the gravy, please? Oh, Captain Oates. I like Fist of Fun. Will you hurry up, please? These are banana bubbles, too. It's delicious. They're, right. the, they're the cereal that think they're a milkshake. <laughs> For me, the fact they're able to think is the advertising self. <laughs> but... Actually, talking of that, Rich, yeah. the ability to think, if, um, if you haven't got much money or resources, one way of filling up your time is by using your imagination, right? Mm. Uh, for example, in the early hours of the morning, I like to lie awake imagining that my ex-girlfriend is stealing all my friends off me and towing them against me. <laughs> John Lennon was another person with a powerful imagination, Stu. He could yeah. imagine many things. He, uh, he could imagine there was no heaven. It was easy if he tried. He could just do it and just make it up. He could imagine all the people sharing all the world. No. Poof, just in there. Poof, yeah, like that. <laughs> Get this. He could imagine looking glass people, right? No. That's not it. What? Eating marshmallow pies. Good God. Imagine being able to imagine that. That's an incredible Amazing, thing. Yeah. And he could, he could even imagine, Stu, that Yoko Ono was in some way attractive or talented. <laughs> so, Willis in that thing, he was trying to catch him. They lay eggs. Yeah. They lay their eggs. It's a bit like that thing on Vision On, and it went, woo, woo. <laughs> Could be worked in. This. Perhaps uh, one way of getting round the no friends dilemma is to live in a false world of your own imagination. So, is there anyone in the audience tonight who's got an imaginary friend? What about you? Have you got an imaginary friend? No, my friend. No? Uh, what about you? Have you got an imaginary friend? Um, yeah, my, uh, my imaginary friend is 19th century scientist Michael Faraday, right. who invented electricity. Um, but in my imagination, he's a bit like a giant lamb. Right. Um, with a lion's face. Mm. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he's not the same as he is really in the history books. Uh, he doesn't really like electricity. <laughs> and, of course, um, he's been transformed into a lamb lion. Right. <laughs> but, but, it, but it really is him. It is him. Good. 
Um, oh, you've got one. What about you? Have you you've got an imaginary friend, yeah? Yes. Yes, my imaginary friend is called Jeremy Charlson, right. and he works as a civil servant in Whitehall. <laughs> it's not very good, really, because I rarely see him because he's out at work all day, yeah. and when he gets home, he's very tired. <laughs> also, being a civil servant, he's very sensible and he never wants to come out and play. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if something happens at home, like a plate gets broken or shampoo gets put in the sugar bowl, I can't blame Jeremy Charlson because everyone knows he, he, he'd he never do, do that, anything silly he? like that. No. <laughs> civil servant. No. <laughs> um, what about you? Have you got an imaginary friend? Hang on! <laughs> I, I know you from somewhere. Or have you just got one of those kind of faces? That... No, it's you, isn't it? From, from school, Harvey. Harvey the rabbit boy. Harvey Inkbarrow, yeah. Who are you talking to, Stu? <laughs> Have you got an imaginary friend, Pete? Um, well, I, I find it really hard to imagine anything. Right. So... <laughs> but so if I try to start imagining an imaginary friend, I start with, like, an arm. <laughs> but then when I get to the face, I've forgotten the arm. <laughs> and then the face gets connected to, like, a kettle or something like that. <laughs> Of course, uh, you've got an imaginary friend, haven't you, Rich? No. Yeah, you have. It's me. Because <laughs> you imagine I'm your friend, but I'm not. Well, at least I'm not seeing imaginary giant rodents in our audience tonight, am I, Stu? <laughs> ah! Ah! Is this some mice I see before me? Or are that but mice of the minder? Ah! 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 Huh? <gasps> Rich, Rich, you know, um, earlier on, those mice you were talking about, right, is it really true the Pied Piper came and got them? Yes. It's just that uh, your flatmate said, right, that you trapped them under a spice rack with a piece of board, <laughs> threw some cumin in their eyes, right, <laughs> waited until they'd nearly starved to death, and then got him to smash them over the head with a rock. No! <laughs> no, it was the Pied Piper! He did it! The Pied Piper! was quite unprepared for the friendly welcome he got from the club secretary. Has everybody who came without a friend now got one? Yes! Excuse me. Excuse me, I, I haven't. <laughs> right, uh, will anyone be this bloke's friend here? I will. <laughs> oh, no, mate, it's, it's all right. Um, I, I've just remembered I've got to go and uh, do a thing. <laughs> well, never mind, because perhaps having friends isn't all that it's cracked up to be anyway. I remember talking to my granddad and he said one of the things that he hated about getting old was slowly watching all of the friends that he'd grown up with dying off one by one. And I said to him, well, granddad, you fed them those berries. <laughs> Stu, I'm going to have to stop you there. Uh, we, don't, we can't cut into the time for the World Championship snooker. We're going to have to get back into our face now. Okay, uh, unless the, this is the repeat, in which case, well, I don't know what it would be. No way of knowing. I'm There's not no Nostradamus, am I? Mean, it you could know. be in the future. <laughs> this this programme could look as ridiculous in ten years' time as... The glam metal detectives does now. Who yeah, knows? who knows? So, uh, <laughs> right, Thanks a lot. Let's go. Oh, no, poo, I've made a smell in the air. Oh, it's horrible. Ah!
welcome to Fist of Fun, the lifestyle show which has already been described by Somerset's Western Daily Press as not at all funny. <laughs> that was uh, Chris Rundle there. Chris Rundle, Chris he Rundle. described it that. Look at this stupid Cornish face oh. there. <laughs> The thing, uh, the thing to remember about Chris Rundle, though, is he is a TV reviewer for a Somerset newspaper and therefore has probably not actually seen a television before. <laughs> and this is given away by this genuinely real sentence in this review where he says, Television demands a conscious effort to sit down and concentrate on the images and sounds <laughs> on the screen. So, not so much a review of a television programme there as a review of the idea of television. It's fun! Yeah, and can I just say at this point as well, uh, four weeks in, to any teenage girls watching, please, please, stop pestering us and stop sending in all your letters and knickers in the post. <laughs> just the knickers on their own yeah, will suffice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't read the letters anyway, we just throw them away. So, uh, anyway. It's great, though, getting all this attention in the papers and Not really, which, no, I hate it, actually. What? I hate it. That's... You know what, I hate it because everyone that likes comedy is a horrible, hideous, mad, obsessive, ugly freak, aren't That's they? That's not true. <laughs> Look at this audience tonight, look at them. It's like Todd Browning's freaks out there, it really is. <laughs> There's that bloke in the front row there, for example, right? He is so hideous that the British Broadcasting mm. Standards Authority yep. will not allow us to beam a picture of him mm. into your home. They won't allow it. Barely semi-human, he looks Stoop. like some kind of weird creature Stoop. that's been assembled from the, the scarred body parts of old Hollywood Stoop. screen monsters. All right, lay off, Stu. That what? isn't a freakish comedy fan. It is. That's my dad, actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's just down for the week, came to see the show, see how I was getting on. Yeah. If you must know, he's having a few problems at home with my I'm mum, sorry. actually. Needed, <laughs> really needed a bit of a break, actually, sorry. so I hope that makes you feel I'm really, better. I'm sorry feel to good. hear that. I'm sorry. Sorry, Keith, sorry about that. <laughs> Although, looking at him, it's not surprising, is it, really? <laughs> he's let himself go, hasn't he? I mean, you know, your mum's an attractive woman. She could do a lot better than that old aardvark face. <laughs> All right, so you lay off. That is an aardvark, is obviously. Oh, yeah. My dad's next to the aardvark. <laughs> in the jar there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry about that. So, uh, so this is uh, this is your dad, is it, Rich? There, the uh, the amazing jarred man of Somerset. <laughs> yes, he copes very well, though, considering. Well, I wish you'd told me earlier, because I've been dipping my crisps in him all afternoon. <laughs> it's good though, because I put them in plain. They came out a kind of prawn cocktail flavour. <laughs> Give them back All to right. me. Don't you worry, Dad. Don't listen to him. Just because someone's a little bit different or strange doesn't mean they can't live a perfectly full, ordinary life. Well, he can't, can he? He's in a jar, let's face it. <laughs> well, no, he can't. That wasn't a very good example, oh, yeah, but otherwise... Fist! I am Pestilence, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> My day begins at 6am. Each day, as I have done since the beginning of all time, I ring up one of the other horsemen to see if today is the day. Hello, War. Pestilence, it's six o'clock in the morning. What do you want? Is it the apocalypse today, War? Pestilence, has Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, an abomination of the earth, drunk the blood of the saints yet? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> no. It's not the bloody apocalypse, is it? Bat! <laughs> No, no. I don't have a horse anymore. You have to move with the times, and a horse, well, it's not the most modern or efficient way to spread pestilence around the world, is it? No. So now, now I've got a milk float, <laughs> which I suppose makes me the milkman of the apocalypse. <laughs> and it means I can do a milk round, which gets me out of the house, you know. Yeah, and I know what the others say about me behind my back, you know, that I, I could drive a big, fast car or a tank instead, but... A milk float runs on electricity, which is good for the environment. <laughs> I know that sounds a bit rich coming from me, considering that eventually I'm going to be responsible for the decimation of the entire planet Earth. <laughs> but until that day, we've only got one world, and I, for one, intend to look after it. <laughs> say the man is an absolute stupid ass. If the rest of us aren't busy, we try and do something destructive with our time. Keep our hand in. 
War might pop down to the Gulf and write Saddam Hussein is gay, love Kuwait on a wall. <laughs> or death might try and persuade Evil Knievel to come out of retirement. <laughs> we hate being around with pestilence. When the four of us go out together, he makes us look like idiots! <laughs> Mrs. Dan, please, use your two pints. Oh, yes, please, you charmer. <laughs> it's the best milky we've ever had. And although he's a bit odd-looking, I know lots of housewives around here who'd love to get their hands on his extra pinter, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean his cock. <laughs> you do have to be careful, though, because uh, I keep my supply of pestilence in milk bottles on my float, and uh, once I... Uh, Accidentally got the milk and the pestilence mixed up and uh, <laughs> took me a while to build the round up again after that. I can tell you. <laughs> I am a dafty. 8 pm. I've watched Emmerdale and it's time for bed. I like the milk round, I like meeting people, and I like milk. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow will be the apocalypse. I hope not. Mrs. Dan Fleece's husband is away on business and she's ordered some of my special yoghurt. <laughs> Fist of fun. We dare you to see them, but don't come alone. Thank you. Have you been up to anything interesting this week? Well, yes, I have, actually. I've been filling in one of these uh, organ and kidney donor cards. That's very nice of you. Your organs will help someone to live after your death. Well, not really, Rich. The thing is, you see, I'm 27 now. My internal organs are largely useless and spoiled. But, um, <laughs> what you can do with these is have a bit of fun. There, where it says, in the event of my death, please contact, you can put in the name of someone that you really hate. And, uh, <laughs> the name I've chosen is the name of the Cornish playwright and puppeteer, Patrick Marber. <laughs> who appears in the day-to-day -day and Saturday Zoo. Put that in there. Uh, of course, uh, you can do this at home yourself. Now, you don't have to put in Patrick Marber's name, but it is better if you do. You do <laughs> put in his name. What about you, Rich? What have you been up to this week? Uh, well, you know, I've been a bit worried, cos I think I've been putting on a bit of weight this week. Have you? Yeah, you have been getting a bit fat, haven't you? Um, no, Stu, no. I'm not fat. I am big bone. Mm. That's <laughs> that. Yeah, and you'll notice with Rich, the biggest bone he's got is this really large curved bone. <laughs> It's like a sort of shell, like some sort of creature might have, isn't yeah, it? A tortoise yeah. or something. Yeah, all Skeleton. right. Yeah, all right. So I realised things were getting a bit out of hand last Saturday. Well, it all happened just a little bit like this. You don't have to do that. I like doing anything. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> do They'll do it. Right? Hello, Pizza House delivery. Can I take your order, please? Yeah. Hi. I'd like. Hey, Richie! <laughs> Number one customer, nice to hear you. Yeah, hello, how <laughs> How did you know it was me? Have you got some kind of computer phone that brings up my details or something? Rich, matey, we would never forget you, oldest friend and dearest customer. <laughs> Miss Erin, I want to thank you. Because of you, my seven children and their wives and husbands were all still working here. I fall down before you. <laughs> hey, Richie, we was worried about you. You know, ring us up at this lunchtime. Where you was? Look, I just want some pizza. I'd like, uh... Yeah, yeah. Two large country feast pizza with mushroom and sweet corn, garlic bread supreme, hagen das ice cream, and a bottle of Diet Pepsi. <laughs> yes, I've got, got a, a few friends, friends coming around for a party. <laughs> Jimmy Hill, he come round! <laughs> Jimmy Hill with his <laughs> big chin! <laughs> and my address is... Come on, Rich! Why you take out the piece from your old mates? We know your address by now. I would hope so! <laughs> Look, I'm gonna have to go. There's someone at the door. Hey, Charlie! <laughs> they already sent me round. It saved a lot of time. Gets the ovens free for all the other customers, you know? <laughs> I've decided to do something about it and go on a diet. Oh, diet, Rich, come on. There's nothing sissy about a man in 90s Britain caring about the way he looks, Stu. There is. There isn't, because if, <laughs> if fat is a feminist issue, where does that leave Bernard Manning? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. There are lots of diets, though, you can choose from. This is one I've tried. It's the genuinely real eat more, weigh less diet. <laughs> this one doesn't work, though. Um, <laughs> if you eat more, you weigh more. That's the way it works. Uh, I believe it works on the principle if you eat so much, you'll get so fat it goes all the way around past infinity and comes out thin again. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. I think it's based on an old episode of Star Trek or something. Yeah, um, <laughs> another one you could have a go at is this. It's the, the Cambridge diet. Okay. Um, this involves cycling around in a long blue scarf <laughs> and being rude and obnoxious to decent, ordinary local people. <laughs> you don't lose any weight, but it does entitle you to a part in any film by Kenneth Branagh. Oh, that's good. Yeah. There's a bit of a, a side effect with it, though. After about ten years, you go a bit mad and paranoid and strange and have to run away to Belgium. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that doesn't work, because everyone there is so fat that, comparatively, you will have some self-esteem, which that's is nice. True. Some people we feature on this show choose to live outside the constraints of society, whilst others, like our lifestyle expert Peter, are forced to do so because they stink. <laughs> so, breathe through your mouths as you welcome him, Peter! <laughs> Hello. I've been spending some time with my friend. <laughs> He's called Donny Oddlegs. <laughs> anyway, one of the really good things about never having anything to do ever is that whenever you want, you can go on holiday. Here are some really good ideas of how you can have a foreign holiday, but at a really low cost. Number one, lie on the floor of your bed, sit in your pants, like this. <laughs> and imagine that the bare light bulbs the sun, <laughs> the bits of dirt and mouse toilets underneath your uh, sand, <laughs> and the stink from your laundry basket is the smell of a sewage tanker going past. <laughs> mm, that was quite a big one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. Shell. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, easy holiday romance. Play with your winky. <laughs> for a fortnight. <laughs> then never see him again. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Number three, simulate your holiday flight being delayed by strikes by getting the tube to Heathrow Airport and sitting in one of those chairs for about two days. <laughs> And every now and again, looking up at the flight departures board and going... <laughs> <laughs> Finally, lots of people make friends on holiday with somebody whose language they don't understand, don't they? So why not go and make friends with the man who stands by the bottle bank next to Balham tube station all day? <laughs> Drinking medicine and shouting. <laughs> He's impossible to understand. <laughs> Right, I'll finish with another nice recipe. And Rich did a bit earlier about pizzas, didn't he? And we all know, don't we, how exciting it is to order a delivery pizza. <laughs> <laughs> because you actually get to speak to somebody. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't got a phone. I mean, I've tried writing, but it's not the same, really. It? <laughs> well, here's a delicious solution. Get a Farley's Rusk. <laughs> Smear some red sauce on it. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> Cheese what sits on the top? <laughs> Pizza. <laughs> oh, and for the olives, green clarets. <laughs> but remember, this is a delivery pizza, so get a doll. <laughs> you can buy these in the Everything A Pound shop in Ballam High Road. <laughs> Unfortunately, this one's lost her head, so what I'm going to do is imagine that she came off a motorbike on the way here. <laughs> anyway, give her the pizza. Uh, Stand her outside the front door like that. <laughs> Sit back down. Then after half an hour, go... Hello? <laughs> Pizza? <laughs> Coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, there you go. Mm. <laughs> Remember, you must do that within half an hour, otherwise you'll have to make yourself a free garlic bread for the doll to give you as well. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Wait, no, I've warned you about that, not that far. <laughs> right, Sorry. Now, some people have been writing into us, Pete, saying that we bully you. That's not true, is it? Mm -hmm. So that's not true, is it? It's not, it's not true no, we bully no, him. You no, you probably slipped then. I did yeah. slip, yeah. <laughs> because uh, every week we pay Pete one whole can of pop. This oh. is Sun Charm Sparkling Orange Aid here. <laughs> there you go, Pete, tuck oh, into that, mate. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. 
So I must have got shaken up in the bag or something, Pete. Sorry about that. That's all right. I needed a shower anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> and remember, Peter fans, the more you sympathise with Peter, the more we will bully him. Aww. I'm glad we understand one another. <laughs> 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 Get sacked from the pizza place. It's <laughs> fun. This is my uh, passport, and uh, in the back of here, where it says "person to contact in the event of an accident," you'll see <laughs> written, there, <laughs> written there Patrick Marber. So you know something you might like to try yourself if you have time. This is the backstage area, Dad. Is, is, your, uh, is your dad having a good uh, trip, is he, in London? Oh, yeah, he's had a great day, actually. He yeah. came up on the train from Western yeah. Supermare and uh, he's been sightseeing. It's right. been a really exciting day for him, actually. Yeah, it, it must, be, uh, <laughs> must be exciting, cos, of course, uh, he's come up from Somerset, hasn't he, your dad? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it'd be very exciting for any of your county folk to climb inside the belly of a giant steel snake and then... <laughs> and then two hours later to be spat out in the fabled city of London. Where the people walk about on their hind legs, don't they? <laughs> Using words and language to communicate rather than just grunts and sort of facial gestures like yeah. back at home. <laughs> it wasn't so long ago, was it, Rich, that people in Somerset thought that if you went past the Axbridge bypass, you'd fall off the edge of the world. <laughs> It wasn't very long ago. As that. a matter of fact, my friend Brian Bancroft travelled as far as Swindon as early as the late 1980s, yeah. Stu, so... <laughs> facts, right? Yeah, he did, Rich, didn't he? And he returned with a battery-operated torch, and then he became crown king of all Somerset, didn't he? <laughs> no, he did. He didn't. He did, he did, he did, you Rich. didn't. You know very well he only became the Bishop of Bath and Well. <laughs> I like Fist of Fun. Will you hurry up, please? Join me and Stuart now as we empty our sacks <laughs> to pay this week's visit to... The, the gallery. gallery. <laughs> this is a game here sent in by Caroline and Tara from Devon where you have to find famous celebrities inside crisp packets. <laughs> Down here is Peter Stringfellow. <laughs> and up there, that's sister Wendy Beckett inside a packet of pickled onion meanies there. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> this is a pair of pants wrapped in cellophane that Owen Thomas has sent us. Uh, they're his father's pants there. Thanks for those, Owen. <laughs> This is a magic eye picture made out of barcodes. <laughs> uh, Miss E. Davis says, if you stare at this for a very long time, you'll see absolutely nothing at all. So, uh, <laughs> like most magic eyes in that respect. <laughs> and uh, Paul Kelly of Dumfries has sent this in. It's a collection of one-week shopping receipts belonging to the old grey whistle test presenter Whispering Bob Harris. There they are. <laughs> he's, he's bought a Stinger yeah. and a copy of Q magazine. And he's, been to and the he's, speed he's bank. withdrawn ten pounds from the speed bank there as well. <laughs> <laughs> two pounds, two left in left his account. Ask, yeah. <laughs> Do keep your stuff coming in to the address which is on your screens now while I'm speaking with my voice. Do we have visitors from space? Are the many sightings fact or fiction? I'm going out into our audience now because I believe somewhere we've got a, a couple who've got an unusual uh, lifestyle. Um, yeah, there they are. Will you please welcome, from Solihull in the West Midlands, Adam and Tina Hartiman. There they are. <laughs> Adam, Tina, thanks for coming in. And the thing about you is you are both modern-day vampires, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. yes Tina, yeah. Adam, if you don't mind me saying, the first thing that strikes me about you both, you know, is you don't look very much like the sort of traditional version of vampires, you know? <laughs> no, it's, not, it's, it's Hollywood, really, you yeah. know. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's done us a ridiculous disservice, making us into stupid stereotypes, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, cos yeah. we don't all wear black, black. and uh, have pointed teeth and fly into people's <laughs> rooms and bite them around the neck and face. Right. You know, to, uh, to all intents and purposes, we're... Uh, just, just like, like anyone else, really. Anyone else, love, that's yeah. right. Yes, I'm a voluntary swimming teacher for handicapped children, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Adam here, he's a member of the Solio Alliance. <laughs> the thing about you is that you both do only eat human blood, don't you? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But in this day and age, we don't slaughter unwilling virgins. No. <laughs> We've got a very supportive network of friends and neighbours, don't we, Poppet? Oh, yes, that's yes. right. And, and we only drink blood that they've spilt by accident, accident. as well. You know? <laughs> so through uh, careless nasal hair clipping, for example. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> or if a little kiddie wink has tripped up in the street and, and scuffed his tiny knee, oh, yes. we're down there. How, how does that little... work in practice, though, Adam? I can't. Well, we could come and show you if you like. Okay, well, that's Team Adam Hartman. Thank you. Come down. Right. <laughs> all right, uh, all right, Rich. Uh, now, 
Uh, just imagine, for example, that you've been accidentally smacked, smacked in the face. <laughs> <laughs> then oh, he's a vampire could feast on his wound, you see, then you go easy. <laughs> from people who've cut themselves in unusual oh. places. <laughs> and a uh, lot of these cuts, well, they don't look exactly like accidents to me. <laughs> but as vampires, we're obliged to have a bit of a suck anyway. <laughs> that's, um, that's interesting, actually, Tina, because I've got a bit of a, a weeping sore at the moment in a bit of an unusual place. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, maybe after the show, you'd like to have a look at it with your mouth, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe later. Yeah. Okay. Get yeah. off! Get off! Yeah. 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 But, Adam, yeah. oh, God, what happens if none of your friends have cut themselves? I mean, don't you starve? Uh, well, we have to uh, bend the rules a bit, really, Rich. Uh, can I call you, Rich? I feel I know you now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll check the bins at the local hospitals, you know, or, or hang around at local accident black spots and hope for the best, really, you know. <laughs> but we'll never try and cause accidents, though, you know, by spreading oil on the road and leaping out in black capes. <laughs> no, no, oh, no, no, we never no, do that. No, no. No. Right, and now my bloodthirst is satiated. <laughs> oh, hold on, Mr. Bit. Oh, oh. Oh, Off you come, oh, Poppy. Oh. Oh. oh, nice, actually, a bit salty. <laughs> you were saying earlier on that, you know, all your community are very supportive of well, you. Well, on the whole, yeah. Yeah, on the whole, but that isn't exactly the case, is it? We've got a, a bit of film here from your local priest, the Reverend Raymond Van Halen. Oh. <laughs> To all intents and purposes, Tina and Adam are a very nice and respectable couple. They're very community-spirited, and they aren't doing anyone any real harm. <laughs> but, as their parish priest, it is my duty, in accordance with God's holy written law, to nail huge wooden stakes through their hearts until they'd be dead. <laughs> it's not a very pleasant duty. I much prefer christenings. So that's a bit different to what you were saying, isn't I it? I mean, we've all got very different beliefs. Yeah. Well, I'll we? tell I mean, you, you what. I'll tell you what. If I was him, I'd make sure my windows were shut, especially during the night. <laughs> yes, because even the tiniest opening can let in unknown wonders. <laughs> well, Tina Adam, thanks for coming in, and I'll, I'll see you at the end. I'm in that. Right. That's right, my so plate in there. That, in there. Okay, that thanks a lot for coming in. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. He's odd, that bloke. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's odd. Mr. Fun. In a desperate, endless fight against a nameless horror. This is uh, my girlfriend, Julia, Dad. Yeah, don't, don't be scared. It's only a photograph. Don't worry, it's fine. All right. Oh, I love you, Richard. I love you too, Julia. Can I come to the arcade with you tonight? Well, yeah, yeah, lots of uh, pictures of uh, Julia Sawala from Press Gang up there, Rich. Yeah, I'm a number one fan, yeah. Stu. I am. Uh, this is a shrine I've created in honour of her talent and beauty. It's you've nice, worked, isn't you've it? worked very hard on that, haven't you? Yeah, very well, good. I love her, you see. I really love her. Because, in fact, my ideal woman would have the head of Julia Sawala yeah. on the body of Julia Sawala. Yeah. <laughs> So, surely you just mean, you know, more simply, that your ideal woman would be Julia Sawala? No, sir, I don't think you were listening, were you? I, I, <laughs> I said the head of Julia Sawala on the body of Julia Sawala. I said nothing about them being connected, did I? You've got to listen to what people say. And th is this some kind of door? Is this open? You're, you never go in there! You, well, you leave that alone! Right, no well. one's allowed in there What's apart from me and one other special person. All right, OK. All right, you never go in there! Go in there. Well, All right! I will go in when you're... You don't ever go in there! I won't. Stupid, that is, anyway. You shut up! I am Simon Quinlake, here with yet another hobby you could engage in. I am the king of hobbies, and know more hobbies than anyone, even Neil Petark, who only knows 312, the hobby idiot. <laughs> what do you do for this week's hobby? Some paper and sellotape. The use of a photocopier or photocopying machine. A flask of weak lemon drink <laughs> and a face. <laughs> this week's hobby is called photocopying your face onto a piece of paper and then sticking that piece of paper with sellotape face facing inward onto the window of a right wing celebrity. <laughs> Here is what you must do go to the photocopier, press your face against the photocopier glass. <laughs> like this. And then pull down the lid as far as you can. Take care not to crush your head to a pulp. <laughs> Press the start button. <laughs> and hey, presto, a photo image of your face will appear. You will notice that the nose and cheek appear as if pressed against glass, because they were. <laughs> Next, 
Choose a celebrity who has openly professed his or her right-wing inclinations. There are loads to choose from. Johnny Morris. <laughs> Gary Newman. <laughs> Gary Bushell. <laughs> Ted 321 Rogers. <laughs> Morris McWhorter. <laughs> Today, I have chosen the news of the world's voice of reason, Lord Woodrow Wilde. <laughs> celebrity you have chosen's house. Sneak up to the right-wing celebrity's lounge window and then stick the photocopy of your face to the window with sellotape with the face facing inwards. <laughs> and then and hide yourself in the right-wing celebrity's garden and wait until the right-wing celebrity returns. If you didn't drink your weak lemon drink earlier, drink it now. Quickly, there won't be any time later. <laughs> Lord Woodrow White is back. Wait until Lord Woodrow Wyatt gets into his lounge. If you can't really see what's going on, you might like to get a bit closer to the window so you get a better view. Ah, look at Lord Woodrow Wyatt's face! Ah. Clear off. Oh. And then run away quickly. Remember to take your empty flask with you, as it may be used in evidence against you. Um, don't worry about the photocopy of your face. A photocopy can't be used in court. Probably. <laughs> Just the fun. It makes me mad with power. Anyway, it's uh, the end of the show now. Thanks a lot for coming along. Uh, next week, we'll be looking my, at some. Have you seen my dad? I left him yeah, over he there. He was, he was down there. Where is yeah. he? Dad? <laughs> Peter! <laughs> so I thought it was pickles. Peter, <laughs> you ate my dad. I mean, I thought you left it for me like the can of pop. <laughs> delicious. You ate him, Pete. You ate my dad. You ate him up. Would you like me to sick him up for you? <laughs> no, leave him, no, leave him, leave him, Rich. Eating your dad is a mistake anyone could have made. Come on, let's I'm leave him. I'm gonna get you. No, leave him. But he's my dad, Stu. I loved him. I loved him as well, Rich. He was really... Terrible. All right, no, okay, okay, leave him. Okay, get in, the, get in your box, right? It's not the time for violence. It's the time for remembering, you know, what a good bloke your dad was and contemplating that, right? And anyway, it was only a bit of meat. Anyway, wasn't it? Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, you're right, okay. I suppose. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. See, See you next, next time. week. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oi. Tina. Tina tells me you've got a bit of a weeping sore. Well, I it's cleared up now. It's all right. Uh, hey, shut no, it's up. Gone. It's cured. You want it's it. It's all right. You want it. No, it's fine now. It's fine now. <laughs> Leave it. Oh. And they call me Richard Herring. <laughs> oh, thank you. And welcome to Fist of Fun. Fist of Fun. It's been a terrible week for me. Mm. Last Thursday, I was wrongfully accused of sexually harassing my domineering nymphomaniac female boss. Mm. And when I brought the case to court, I inadvertently brought about the collapse of an under-the-counter million-dollar deal for the international electronics giant that I work for. <laughs> no, I think what you've done there, right, Rich, <laughs> is you've confused your life with the film Disclosure, haven't you? <laughs> yes, yeah, I have, yeah. 
but I went, I went to the cinema. You don't even work for no, that. No, I don't. I, don't work. What, what I did, I went to the cinema and yeah. saw Disclosure. That's yeah, what I did. It, it was yeah. really good. Yeah, it's yeah. very vivid. It it's just like you're there, isn't oh, it? No, it's but so you've cool. got to think. <laughs> You got to think what well, you've been from Somerset and that the cinema must be an overwhelming uh, thing yeah. to see. <laughs> All those lights. Stu, and... we've had cinema in Somerset for ten or fifteen years yeah. now. <laughs> Admittedly, it's just one of those spinning things you, you look, look through, through the and there's thing. a little man sort of thing leaping out like that. But yeah. you know, don't, very don't, good. don't worry about it. Don't worry. don't worry though, because Rich, a lot of people are yeah, but... a lot of people are enormously influenced by what they see at the cinema. I am. I've been doing this. I can this. see you're one yeah. of them. <laughs> The Harrison Ford film Witness made the world aware of the peaceful and gentle religious cult, the Amish, who've forsworn the use of all modern 20th century inventions for a simple life. But just outside Shrewsbury, a British offshoot of the cult has been set up with one small but significant change. <laughs> yes, Stuart. Back in the 1980s, Maureen and me joined the Amish cult over in that America. Right. We'd seen Witness and we liked the clothes, the simple life, the building barns, the use of grain towers as a method of execution. It's all very natural. And we had understood that they wouldn't use any modern inventions, and we agreed with that. I mean, we both voted green in the 1988 Euro election. <laughs> but after a couple of hours, I went to my neighbour Samuel and said, you know, can I borrow the old phone, mate, for a minute, you know? Who's <laughs> We have no phone, brother, for it is an evil and modern vanity. <laughs> <laughs> phone isn't modern, is it? It was invented by Alexander Graham Bell in about 1880-something. I mean, that is really old, isn't it? So, uh, how did you react to that? What did you do? Well, Stuart, we did have to leave after that. But us and a few of the others who saw that I was right came back to Shrewsbury here to found our own anti-modern community, the Conkeys. Conkeys? <laughs> named after me, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, Ian Conkey. <laughs> and we, we kept the suits and the, and the hats and the barns and all that malarkey, but we decided to make the cut-off point of what made things evil much more sensible, you know. So we both decided, we all decided, that that date should be the 6th of December, 1982. 1982. <laughs> Some really useful inventions by then, but things hadn't got really out of control, like they have in the madness of modern times. <laughs> well, come through and enjoy this. Uh, this is oh, our games room. Stuart Lee, fist of fun, everyone. There well, he is. Uh, well, Right, now let me get this straight. All yeah. the games in here from before 1982 Red. December, yeah? That's right. right. This is our computer expert, Dave Pantme. Hi, Dave. Hi. What is he playing here, then, Dave? Well, I'm playing an Atari tennis game. <laughs> Basically, all uh, modern games, they're vain, they're evil, and they're the product of the Dark Lord that is Satan. I see. Now, to me, this looks like just boring blocks. What is it that's good about no, it? No, no. You can use your imagination. What are you imagining now, then? Well, I'm imagining that I'm Virginia Wade, and I'm playing Yvonne <laughs> Goolagong, yeah. and right. I'm wearing a white dress. <laughs> OK. Okay, what about something like Galaxians? Would you play that, Dave? Oh, no, 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 1983. <laughs> There's lots of choice of games to play as well. Yeah. You could have Kaplunk there, my wife. There. Good old Simon. <laughs> Rubik's Cube there, and uh, there's young Zadok on the swing ball. Look at that. <laughs> you know, Stuart, people think it must be hard making food without modern equipment. Yeah. But it's not. Look. So what, what have you got on the go here, then, Maureen? Cheese and pickle. Right, Lovely. cheese and pickle toasty. So what else could you eat apart from a cheese and pickle toasted sandwich, then? Well, a ham and cheese toasty, yeah. or a ham and pickle toasty. Yeah. Cheese and ham and tomato toasty. So it's a sandwich toasty based diet. <laughs> That's right. Or a cup of soup. Or soup. Yeah. Sarah's making the drinks look. <laughs> so to speak, Tyza Stewart, get busy with the physic. <laughs> Is 1982, is that always going to be the cut-off point for your society, is it? Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> 1982 is when modern inventions began being invented. Can't you see that, you know, in 100 years' time, 1982, that's not going to be modern, is it? In the same way as, you know, the uh, 1800s. You know, that's not modern to you now. Can you see? No. 1982 <laughs> is our cut-off point. Do you see? 1982 is modern. The 1800s aren't. Can't you even see that? Your refusal, the Conkey's refusal to embrace, you know, now as, as modern, that's going to look as ridiculous in the future as, as the Amish do to you now, do you see? No. Yeah. Our cut-off point is 1982, and that's that. So... <laughs> as night falls on the Conkey community, a calm descends. A calm that we, the slaves of the technology of the 90s, can never hope to experience.
imagine for a moment that the elephant man had impregnated one of those novelty gonks you sometimes win at the fair. <laughs> imagine how horrible looking the spawn of that unholy union would be. <laughs> Are you imagining it? Horrible, isn't it? Ugh. <laughs> well, we think that the afterbirth of such a creature <laughs> might resemble our regular lifestyle expert and father cannibal, Peter. <laughs> All right, Peter, how are you? You remember, you, uh, you ate my father last week, do you yes, remember? Yes, yes, I'm very sorry. I yeah. That, yeah. My, my, fr my friend Donny Oddlegs, he could be your dad. <laughs> Watch him, just leave it, all right? <laughs> Hello, and yes. And I'd like to start with one of my lifestyle grooming hints this week. Clothes can be really expensive these days, can't they? Especially in posh places like Bernardo's. <laughs> but there are plenty of bargains around if you look hard enough. This is a pair of man's knickers here. <laughs> Stuffed in a Coke can vending machine on Ramsden Road in Ballam, sticking out of the bit where the cans come out. They were a bit sort of brown and stinking when I first put them on. So what I did was I sort of went down the swimming pool with them on my legs like this. And I jumped in the water and went like that and then the water. That made me feel a bit odd though. <laughs> Rubbing. You know when your wee comes out a different colour? <laughs> you feel tired. <laughs> there are actually loads of things you can get for free. Here's my guide to fun with no money at all. Number one, go up to the high road and try to see over the crowds of shoppers at the drunk old lady who dances around outside the Abbey National singing Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> and imagine you're at an open-air rock concert. <laughs> Number two, get one of these lottery forms here from the news agents. Then when they do the draw on the telly, just sit there ticking the numbers off as they come up. And imagine you given that and a pound to the news agent an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> or you could play lottery scratch. Just scratch yourself six times in different places. <laughs> and if three of the scratches bleed, you win another scratch. <laughs> Jackpot. <laughs> I just put my hat on. Made myself a chef's hat from a kitchen roll. <laughs> It's good, this. It saves money on shampoo. It just sort of sucks all the grease up, you see. <laughs> right, the recipe is called Easy Pasta. Get a bag of hard, twisty pasta and stuff it in your mouth like that. <laughs> add... add salt. <laughs> then leave for 20 minutes until your spit makes it all go soft. <laughs> it's a bit I started before the show there. <laughs> Finally, serve. <laughs> if you're cooking for more than one person, by the way, you might find some extra room at the back of your mouth under the tongue, just behind the ulcer. I'm not going to hurt. You come on, when I... I'm your friend, Pete, aren't I? <laughs> right, um, you get a lot. You've been uh, doing very well with your bit. It's very popular. You've been Thank getting a lot you. of fan mail, actually. This Thank is you. from Dawn and Claire. Made you this lovely heart made out of sweets. Can you see that? Nice. Isn't that yes. beautiful? Do you want that? There you yes, go. Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, oh. dear, Pete, you've... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, look, it's, it's fallen in there, Pete. What a shame. Yeah. Oh, no, look, I've just tried to light a match and it's slid... Oh, oh what a shame that is, Pete. Let's, and stop sending Pete stuff and being his friends and stuff. We've warned you about it. The more you send, the more we'll hurt him. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, people often ask me and Stu, how we write Fist of Fun. We must be crazy, they mm. say. And, uh, well, I write my lines for the show months in advance because I'm a good person with a good heart and I work hard. <laughs> Whereas Stu is something of a curmudgeon, as you'll have noticed in the series. And he leaves the writing of his parts till the last possible moment like a wazzock would. <laughs> I think that is true. Why do you think you'd do that? Oh, I'm sorry, Rich, I can't answer that. I haven't uh, written this part yet. <laughs> you think it's very clever to be sarcastic, don't you, Stu? No. <laughs> you want to watch out, Stu, yeah, and me. Yeah, 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 you'll be caught out one of these fine, fine days. You will. You want to remember the story of the ant and the grasshopper. Yeah. The <laughs> hard-working, handsome ant. Handsome. He was handsome. Was he? he was industrious. Did he have a blue shirt on? He did have a blue did shirt. He? he was right. industrious in the fields and gathered leaves, or in my case, 
jokes yeah. and witty quips. I see. Yeah. Like Frank Muir might right, think right, up. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was good. Whereas the foolish, cornish faced grasshopper mm. with his stupid <laughs> jacket from some posh shop mm. danced around all the time to music that nobody else would like just yeah, to yeah, show off. Yeah, yeah. And then died in some snow, didn't he, Stu? Do you know yeah, what I mean? Rich, yeah. Ah, no, you not see what art. I'm saying? Art. No, not yes, art. It is no, art. Anyway, it's an art. It is not an art situation. Art. It is, could not be less of one. I hate that insect story. I hate it. I'll tell you why. Because animal fables, right, they're about animals. They've got no relevance to us, have they? Right? And all animal fables are useless because they're about animals and not people and thus have no relevance to our lives. It's not worth getting worked it up about It is though. worth getting <laughs> worked up about. It is, frankly. Let my war against Aesop and all other fable tellers continue. Stuart Lee's True Fables. <laughs> this week, the ant and the man. Once upon a time, there lived an ant. <laughs> and a man. Hello. <laughs> it was summertime, and the sun shone in the field where the ant and the man lived. Hooray! It's summertime, and all is fine. Come on, ant, let's arse around in just our pants, playing <laughs> frisbee and squirting ourselves with water from this hose pipe. Yeah! But the ant did not join in with the man's foolish games because he was responsible and hard-working and was gathering food in preparation for the winter. <laughs> and also because he was an ant and thus could not appreciate the pleasure of tossing a small plastic disc through the air to a man. <laughs> and anyway, he couldn't have done it even if he had appreciated that pleasure because he was an insect with no hands. <laughs> the man taunted the hard-working ant. Ant, you are a twat. Look at this. You spend your whole time carrying leaves from one place to another. But look at me. I'm going to ride down to the park on my ten-speed and drink cider and shout at girls. Are you coming or what? Again, the ant took no heed of the man and went about his work. Because he was an insect and driven purely by instinct and unable to make choices and value judgments. He was an ant. You understand, he was an ant. An ant! <laughs> anyway, all too soon, winter came. The ant was snug in his hole with enough leaves to last the whole winter through. But the man was unprepared for the shifting of the season. What's this? Snow? Oh, no. It's too cold to wear just my pants now, and squirting myself with the hose has now become unpleasant. I have no food with me. What will I do? I know, I'll go home. <laughs> Fortunately, the man, being a human being, had his own centrally heated house and a wardrobe full of warm winter clothing. But, oh dear, due to his tomfoolery in the field all summer, the man had not had time to visit the supermarket, and now it was closed. Shit! <laughs> Hold on. Hello, pizza has delivery. Can I take your order, please? I'd like one large margarita and, uh, yeah, I'll have some garlic bread as well, please. And your name? Uh, it's The Man. Near Man. Uh, no, uh, The Man. T-H-E... P-A-P. -P. No. <laughs> it come to spring, the man ran out of his house and went to the field. And there, what did he see, emerging from his hole? Nothing. The ant, being only an insect, had died of old age. An insect's lifespan is much shorter than our own. You see, it would have made much more sense for the ant to enjoy itself while it could, but instead it chose to work hard all summer and then die alone in a hole underground surrounded by all the leaves that it had needlessly gathered. <laughs> and there's a message for us in that story, and uh, it's that a man is much better than that ant that Rich admired so much and copied and wanted to try and be exactly like <laughs> Rich? Yeah, oh, I was. Where he is? He must be inside his. Uh, I love you, Rich. Julia Sawala oh, yes. shrine. I love you, Rich. You're so beautiful. Yeah, I was feeling pressed. <laughs> uh, what are you doing inside there, Rich? Get out of here! I've told you. Ah, I've told you never to come in my What's Julia this in this shrine? hole? What's this hole here? It's just a well. A well, Rich? Yeah. We don't need a well. If all the water got cut off in the BBC, you'd be very glad of my Julia Sawala well, Stu. Julia Sawala well? 
It's just named in her honour. There's nothing funny about it. Well, there wasn't any water in it or anything. It's no, just... I've got to fill it later. I will fill it. What are these? These infrared glasses you got on here? Yeah, I'm just. I'm going uh, fox watching and oh. badger baiting with David Attenborough oh, yeah. later on. <laughs> these uh, these pictures on the inside. They're very different to the uh, to the ones on the on the outside, aren't they? Yeah. There's, uh, is that, that's Keith Allen there, isn't it? Yeah. He's got a he's got a skewer through his head, Rich. <laughs> That skewer was there already, Stu. I had to work round that. It works out quite easily, no, actually. He doesn't. He, was, he had something going with her for a bit, didn't he, with Julius? Yeah, Stark. the bastard. I hate him. I hate you. What's Keith Allen got that I haven't got, Stu? Well, Rich, he's got um, a lot of talent and money, um, <laughs> film offers, yeah. a hit single with New Order, <laughs> uh, the respect of all of his sort of comedy and acting peers, uh, and he's got Julius Sawala as well, hasn't he? <laughs> He hasn't got a shrine he's made no, in her no, honour, no. has he? A well in it. He hasn't got a well. He hasn't got a wig of, like, her hair, has he? No, he has. He's probably, <laughs> probably very envious of you, I'd have well, thought. Yeah. Fist of fun. Doesn't do a thing for her complexion, does it? You, uh, you did your driving test this week, didn't you, Rich? I did, Stu, and I yeah. passed it. First time. Gee, that's very Char. impressive. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd only had, uh, I'd only had 94 lessons at £16.40 ago yeah. that my driving instructor, Peter, insisted that I have for some reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now, although I can legally drive, I can't afford a car, petrol, or any food or anything at all. Right. Terrible. Yeah, you're not bitter about it, though, are you? Oh, no, no. I mean, he's a professional driving instructor. I mean, what could he possibly have to gain by, mm, you know, mm. making me take far too many lessons? It'd be a waste perhaps, of his time. Perhaps he just enjoyed your company. <laughs> Maybe it was. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't feel he could say, how about we meet up later? Well, perhaps that was But he had to contrive it. this situation. <laughs> there was a tension in the car, yeah. I know. He's so fun. Would you all kindly watch the screen? Hello, I am Peter Dibdin, and I am a driving instructor. It's uh, a great job, as it combines my interests of driving and strictly obeying rules. <laughs> my first pupil today is Sally. She's a new driver, so my driving instructor experience tells me I must not be patronising or arrogant and aware that she may well be a little bit nervous. Now, you need to adjust your seat. Are you in? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Now, Sally, if you all right? Yeah. yeah you're all right. <laughs> be fine. Now, obviously, you know the basic way you operate a car. Even a tiny child knows that. So let's see how you get along with the old pulling away from the curb manoeuvre. Oh, uh, she's my first lesson. I, I, I don't know how. Oh, don't even know that. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, as with all driving manoeuvres, there is a simple procedure to follow when pulling your car away from the curb. Mm -hmm. It is called the pulling away from the curb procedure. <laughs> and it goes like this. Mirror, signal, road ahead. Mirror, road, indicate. Mirror, road. <laughs> mirror, mirror. Road, road. Wing mirror, indicate <laughs> off. Mirror, road. Mirror, mirror. Signal, road. <laughs> and then pull away from the curb. Or, if you prefer, you can remember that by the simple acronym. Mzrum, rim, rum, rower, miam, rum, is more a path K. Come on, quickly, the time is now. Hurry! Okay. Quickly! Mirror, signal, road. Mirror, road. Indicate road. <laughs> what are you doing? You went mirror signal road, mirror road, indicate road. It's mirror signal road, mirror road, indicate mirror road. Rum, rim, rum, rua, me, and rum is rim, rum, okay. My nephew Chris knows that already. He's only 16 years old. How old are you? 26. 26 years old, and you can't even drive? I can. Are you stupid, eh? Are you a stupid fool? Well, why can't you drive then? You can't even drive. A bit grey today, isn't it? <laughs> My next pupil is John. He is more experienced, so things run a little more smoothly. What are you doing? You can't even drive. Are you a fool? What? The car is a dangerous weapon, Mr Harris. More dangerous than a knife. Or the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. What? What am I doing wrong? I'm going to have to stop you there. <laughs> Come on, step out the car. In neutral. <laughs> Look, you see, you're, you're 1.2 metres away from the curb. And if we look at the graph, what does it tell us? Look. 31 miles per hour, 1.2 metres. That's sensible. No, because there were two people in the car, weren't there, Mr Harris? Doubling the exponential anomaly, making danger. <laughs> what am I always telling you? 
Only a fool breaks Peter Dibden's speed stroke distance from the curb ratio modified by the number of people in the automobile rule. Oh, exactly. Are you a fool, then, eh? Are you a stupid fool? <laughs> oh, you shut up. <laughs> you can't even drive it. <laughs> You'll never guess what one of my pupils did today. Oh, go on, spill the beans. You know <laughs> he stalled. Ah! <laughs> stalled? <laughs> he can't even drive! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Come on, it, it's my round. <laughs> no, it isn't your round, Ian. Ian? Don't you even know the buying a round procedure yet? The driving instructor to the left of the last driving instructor to buy a drink must rapidly recite questions from the highway code. And then it is the first driving instructor who fumbles his answer. He must buy the next round. <laughs> Don't you even know that yet? <laughs> Put all the money I've earned that day with all the rest of the money I've earned from a non-driving idiot and roll around in it naked. <laughs> my sensible driving gloves and my comfortable driving shoes. And think of all the money I'm going to earn from all the other fools just because they can't drive. I can drive. I can drive. <laughs> Mr. Fun. I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are. Everyone this week, I was driving around the South Circular Road in South London and I drove past a church uh, with a big sign outside it in six foot high orange capital letters. It said, You won't get to heaven on the South Circular. <laughs> and I thought, No, but I will get to Tooting where I live, <laughs> where all my stuff's kept. So do you believe in Jesus, Stu? Not as such, no, Rich. What I think probably happened is, uh, back in the sort of biblical times, there's probably an ordinary bloke called Jesus, right? But he went around and he did loads of good sort of charitable works, like uh, Annabelle Giles does, right? Yes. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> but because of the superstition backward thinking of the time, mm. he became viewed as a sort of god. He wasn't, but they just thought that he was. Can you see how that might have happened? I can't even begin to contemplate it. Mm. I don't think you're right, because the Reverend Denman of St Andrew's Church in Cheddar yeah. told me that Jesus is literally real in every yeah. sense. And he's everywhere, all the time, watching us, watching everything we no, do. Well, he isn't, he's he's everywhere. Isn't. He isn't, and it really annoys me when you get indoctrinated into those sort of stupid medieval religious beliefs, right? Because there is no Jesus, right? And we have to <laughs> abandon organised religion if we're going to survive into the 21st century, Stu, right? Stu, it's there Jesus. isn't a Jesus. He's, he's here. Well, I explained before, he was just a... No, he's here, character. he's behind he's you. He's not here, Richard. He, he is. Here. Tell him, everyone. He's behind you. But he is there, isn't he? He's not there. Well, all right, okay. Stu, if... he's up on the mountain. He's blessing the little lambs <laughs> and the children. He's look at him. All right, okay. Look at his holy but baleful eyes. All right, all right. Stu, If he's there, <laughs> if he's there, oh. right? Yeah. If I turn round, yeah, I'll see him, won't I? Yes, yeah, you will. Right. So just okay. do that. Right. Okay. I'm going to turn round and I'm going to look for Jesus now. <laughs> not there, Rich, is but it? he was he's not there, there, wasn't he? Not there, right. yeah. Yeah. Right, what you got to do is you've got to get Stu religion back. off the agenda he's, in school. He's on the road to Calvary Hall. Look at his suffering, Stu. Tell him, exist. everyone, he's behind you. What did you say? What? He's behind you. Sorry, I have to speak up. I'm very old. Oh, come on. He's not there anyway. He's not he's there. He's up on the cross, right. Stu. Look. look at all major... Oh. <laughs> He's not look, all right, OK, look, he's, he's there. The if I turn look. round, I'll see him, won't I? You will, All look right, at OK, him. I'm going to turn round... Don't give round. him time to oh, just look. look. I'm going to turn round and I'm going to look for Jesus now. <laughs> oh! You must have seen him. You must have seen him. A bit of he stuff. didn't get out anywhere no, near his time. He wasn't there. Look. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You read Jesus by A.M. Wilson. Jesus is taking the, the Mickey now. The Free Thinker magazine or anything, right? You see, he's not real. He isn't real. And you've got to oh, say no to that. Oh, shoot, Jesus showed his pants really, and really rich. Oh, Look. He's flicking the bit. Jesus! Oh. You're real! <laughs> holy, holy Jesus. Oh, actually, I'm not the real Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just one of his helpers. His helpers? <laughs> yeah, his helpers, you see. Let me explain this to you. You see, mm. Jesus actually finds it very difficult to be omnipresent all the time, right? Yeah. Especially this time of the year, you know, Easter, Ascension Day, hectic right. schedule. So, uh, what he does is he gets one of us helpers to help him out, right? So, if you did happen to see two Jesuses, right, say at a toy shop grotto or maybe at a Christmas parade, remember, <laughs> Jesus is real, but that's just one of his helpers helping him out through a busy period. 
Um, <laughs> I really like what you've tried to do, and the, the clothes, the details, very good. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the thing is, mate, what you've done right is you've confused Jesus of Nazareth, right? <laughs> With Father Christmas, haven't you? <laughs> oh, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mix them up. That'll be why I'm not getting much work. I know, yeah. <laughs> no, call for it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's all right. I'll, uh, I'll get off then. Yeah, okay, you better. Yeah. <laughs> Soon as we while I'm here, I was just wondering if we could get the uh, the uh, the money sorted out. You see, <laughs> what well, I wanted to. Uh, you want us to pay you? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, usually it would go through Jesus, but you know, he always wants his fifteen percent commission. You know, yeah. So, well, <laughs> well a five, a five, a six. No, five. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Won't you? Uh, won't you be in trouble if uh, Jesus finds out you've done that? Ah, well, you see, he won't know, will he? Because I mean, let's face it, <laughs> can't be everywhere at once, can he? No. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, lads. All right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Keep oh, yeah, okay. Quiet. Yeah. Stewie, Stewie, Stewie. <laughs> 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 That's good. Yeah, Stewie, Stewie. 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 Um, have you seen Donny Oddlegs? You know, my green. Yeah, Donny Oddlegs. Dad. He was on your table, wasn't he? Oh, yes. no, Peter's. He's missing. Has Donny Oddlegs gone missing? I, yes. wonder... <laughs> I wonder where he could be. Oh, hold on. That looks a bit like Donny Oddlegs there. <laughs> Hanging, from that... Hanging from that tiny noose. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is him, yeah. Oh, oh dear, Pete. He's, uh, he's dead. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> he's left a note, actually. Dear world, I couldn't stand being with Peter anymore. He is a twat. <laughs> Donny. There, he's dead. Look, can you see? You see, that's for my dad, that is, Pete. That's for my dad. We better put him in the bin with the rubbish where he belongs, haven't we? <laughs> we can cremate him. We had to bury my father this week. There you go. Off he goes. Look at him burn. Watch him. There he goes. <laughs> He's dead, Pete. Dead. Do you hear me? <laughs> that's not it. Right, leave it, Rich. There's no need for that. Get in your crate. He Come ate on. my dad. Well, two wrongs don't make a right, do they? Look at him go. Well, you, you see, know. Pete? That's Donny Oddleg, that is. <laughs> Thanks a lot for, uh, for watching and see you again next week. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>
Nice, yes, not bad, eh? Um, hey. Put them away. I've brought in, uh, instead, I've brought in these five dolls which represent all the people that have lied to me or about me <laughs> in the entertainment industry in the last sort of five years. And also <laughs> these skewers here which can go through their heads like that. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice. What about you, Pete? You got any games to play? I'm, I'm playing hand, hide and seek. <laughs> Get your hand to hide under the quilt and then you go and look for it. That's a nice badge you've got on there, Rich. Yeah, this was uh, sent in to me by my fellow county man, Simon Rudd. Uh, actually, in protest at your continuing ignorance about Somerset mm. and its peoples. Mm. That's very good of him to send that in, Rich. Yeah, isn't it was it? nice, yeah. Especially nice seeing as in Somerset, that small piece of card with blue ink writing on it and a pin stuck to the back with sellotape would be the most extravagant piece of jewellery they'd ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> that badge would be fit to grace the duffel coat of the highest Somerset Lord, wouldn't it, in all of his... <laughs> dirt, no, shoot, no, shoot, no, listen, no, listen, no, listen, what? Sharp, I'm really fed up with this, you know. Why? It's not funny, it's it not even funny. true about Somerset. Somerset. It is true. No, it isn't. Somerset it is. is a place of great natural beauty yeah. and it has produced some of Great Britain's greatest men of letters and culture. Who? Who's that, then? <laughs> Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy was born in Dorset, Rich. <laughs> Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the architect. Born in Devon, of a French father. <laughs> the Wurzels. The Wurzels. No, they're good! <laughs> they're good, they, they are. are. Can't knock them, they're good. They're not rich, there are people more good than them. There they are. are. Ah. No, there aren't. There what do you are. mean, ah? Ah. Fun. The Cubs are dedicated to the pursuit of good and performing good tasks. A recent government report showed that nearly 74% of all good things done in mainland Britain are done by 7- to 10-year-old boys in shorts and green caps. Congratulations, Mrs Hartke. Thank you, Cobb. Here's your five pence. <laughs> We've cleaned all your windows, Mr Shirtbrook. Well done, Cobb. Here's your five pence. Well, oh, Mrs Polybet. It sounds to me like you and your husband's trouble is a lack of sexual variety. I see. Hmm. My advice is to try out some new ideas. Experiments with glamour wear. Different positions. <laughs> what an that you can have. Oh, thank you, Carl. Here's your 5P. Clinton, <laughs> you can't expect your nation's soil to be fertile if you continue to overfarm it. Yes, I see. Try farming less energy-intensive crops and use more organic nutrients. Well, thank you, Cub. The Cub's commitment to good in all its forms is reaffirmed and sustained by their weekly meetings with Arkela. <laughs> Cubs, do your best. Arkela, we will do our best. Cubs, <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, how good will the best you refer to be? It will be 10. Cubs, which is best, good or evil? Good is best. Obviously. Are you insane? No, Cubs. I'm not insane. I was just testing. <laughs> I have created a movement of young boys who will be an influence for good on all their fellow men. But to maintain the yin-yang balance of the cosmos for each good force in this universe, there must be a corresponding and equally powerful force for evil influence. Thus, I have also founded the Scouts. <laughs> yes, the Scouts. The chopper-riding, fag-smoking, woodpecker-cider-drinking, bum-fluff-covered scourge of cubs. Tonight's the night, the final battle with the Cubs, right? Yeah. yeah. If we wipe them out tonight, right, evil will triumph forever! Yeah. Yeah. Evil. Listen, listen, what we've got to do first, we've got to see who can burp the rudest swear words. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 and the peanut, and the peanut, and the peanut yesterday. Yesterday I found the peanut. Found the beam, that is the day. Right, right.
Come the dawn, the cubs count their dead and dying. I've wiped out almost our entire pack. I'm the only survivor from Red Six. And our Kayla has been given a nasty Chinese burn. <laughs> Look. But we will not be deterred from our good works as long as there is one cub able to crawl through the dust. And there are good deeds to be done. We will do our best. <laughs> Just the fun. Let's go, everyone. We've got to stop. One of the nice things about being on the old Wazzock's Lantern is uh, you get into uh, you get contact with all those people you've lost touch with over the years. You know, but there's still some people I wonder where they are. Mm. I often wonder, whatever happened to my old friend Mike Cosgrave? Right. I often That's, wonder. Uh, Mike Cosgrave, your best friend from Devon, Rich. Yeah, yeah, Mike Devon Cosgrave. Yeah. I, often, um, I often wonder. Mike actually lives in your flat with you, Rich. <laughs> see, I've never seen him. Yeah, well, he goes out to work in the day, you see. Yeah. Um, and then at night he goes out with his fiance and they come back after you've gone to bed. <laughs> I wonder if you've been eating all my spaghetti. Yes, him, <laughs> yeah. But thanks to Fist of Fun, I've managed to track down another of those old forgotten faces from my past. So will you please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, it's the girl from my school who smelt of spam. Here she is. <laughs> girl that smelt of spam. Right. Hello, Richard. Very nice of you to have me on the show after all this time. Sit down, please. Now, uh, <laughs> if you remember, you yeah. sat at the back on your own in spelling, didn't you, because no-one wanted to sit with you. You uh, lived above the laundrette with your mum and you had sort of yellowy, gingery, black-brown hair, didn't you? you remember? <laughs> yes. Look, I'm really sorry. I didn't know he was going to... Oh! All right, oh, Stu! You, you, you touched the girl that's not... <laughs> she touched you! Oh, oh, oh Stu! No, no, I'm so child. So mm. pathetic, that is. This is, your, mm. this is your guest that you've had on. If, if I could just interrupt yeah. you, Richard, I, I never actually did smell of spam anyway. You did? Oh, smell of <laughs> spam, spam, spam. I didn't, Richard. Spam! Spam! I didn't smell of spam. You did. Well, did you ever actually smell me? Oh, uh, no. If you went near you, you got fleas. I wouldn't even touch you. <laughs> Richard, I didn't have fleas, actually. Did. I think you'll find that the flea is a member of the Siphonoptera species of insect and is parasitic chiefly on rodents of See? the mammalian class. Rodents. Most larger animals that suckle their young are mainly free of flea infestation. Hmm. <laughs> well, you still smell a spam. <laughs> I didn't, Richard. It was just that... Because I wore glasses, had slightly unusually coloured hair, and my mother... Who could... looked like a man. Yes. <laughs> Who happened to look like a man. Yeah. Couldn't afford to buy me a proper school uniform that you all picked on me. Is that really something so clever to mock? Spam! Stop it! Stop it, right. Oh, she doesn't smell of anything. Doesn't smell of she anything. Does. She doesn't. Well, there's not, you know, surely the only point having the girl that smelt of spam on the show now is for you to ask her, you know, what she's doing today and not just to go on at her like you used to 20 years ago. It's pathetic. Yeah, all right, all right. It is. All right, so what are you doing these days, the girl that smelt of spam? <laughs> Apart from smelling of spam, all of right. course. <laughs> well, Rich, due to the taunts and cruelty I suffered as a child, I came to believe that I really was worthless. Through my teens, I looked for comfort in a string of meaningless sexual encounters. <laughs> I would commit the most degrading acts just for the few seconds of attention that it would bring. In the end, I had a child, Amy, who I loved. And she loved me too. But the authorities declared me an unfit parent and she was taken away from me. I, I don't know where she is. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. You just come out, if you come out here, come out with someone from the... Someone from the production staff. Well, well done, Rich. That's very good, isn't it? <laughs> I hope you're pleased with yourself for making that woman's life turn out like that. I hope you are. Yeah, well, it, it does seem bad, you know. Yeah. The taunting doesn't seem so funny now I'm 27. No. You know? <laughs> it's just childish, isn't it? Mm. I, 
I hope that any five or six year old children who are watching the show tonight will <laughs> learn the important moral that I've learned tonight that, you know, you should treat all your classmates as equals, no matter what their background or their appearance. That's know. really good, Rich. I'm really glad you've managed to see that because it was quite embarrassing. Stu? Yeah, what? <laughs> You're sitting in that chair. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Chair, the girl who smells spam. You get the stinking oh, spam disease. Oh. Hey, get away, spam! Oh, get away! You got the stinking spam disease. Hello. If you have seen me before, then I will need no introduction, as you will recognise my face. If well, this is the first time you have seen me, then I must tell you now that my name is Simon Quinlan, and the thing that I will be telling you about is a hobby you might like to try. What you will need for this week's hobby. A pair of hiking boots, a floor, or hard surface. <laughs> a flask of weak lemon drink, and access to some eggs. <laughs> this hobby is a hobby which you can do anywhere, and thus will take you to a variety of locations. The hobby is called egg smashing. <laughs> if you are a beginner to the hobby of egg smashing, then why not go to a shop or supermarket? Ask the assistant where the eggs are. <laughs> Excuse me, assistant, where are the eggs? Um... Answer me! <laughs> nope. When you will buy the eggs, take one of the eggs out of one of the cartons and then throw it onto the floor. <laughs> now I've smashed your first egg. Hey, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Oi, get back here! Once you have smashed eggs in the supermarkets and the streets a few times, you may begin to feel frustrated. It might seem that the only eggs you smash still more spring up to take their place, like those skeletons in Jason of the Argonauts. <laughs> so, you might like to specialise in a particular kind of egg. If you chose the egg of a rare bird or lizard, there's a good chance that you might be able to smash all those eggs of that kind that exist, thus eradicating those eggs for all <laughs> I'm tracking down the eggs of the noble golden eagle. You can drink your weak lemon drink now. You can wait until you have to go to fly, or you can wait until later. Ah. Smash the eggs! Smash the eggs! The disgusting eggs! Smash them! Smash the eggs! Remember, there are many different kinds of eggs you can smash. Chocolate eggs, fish eggs, and or frog spawn, or bejeweled Fabergé eggs. Now, if you start to find these kind of eggs tedious, and when you're sure that you are sufficiently adept and experienced at egg smashing, then why not try smashing human eggs? <laughs> these are readily available by breaking into a fertility clinic under the cloak of that and... Breaking open the egg fridge, where the eggs are frozen for future use and experimentation. And then, smash the eggs to bits! <laughs> Enjoy your hobby, whatever it is, but smash those whorish eggs! <laughs> it's the fight! In a desperate, endless fight against the nameless horror. You, uh, you're taking down all the pictures of Julia Sawala off your Julia Sawala shrine, Rich. I thought you said you loved her. No, see, that was just a childish phase I was going through, right. you know. It's just pathetic, you know, you'd never believe some of the things I'd started to think of what I was going to do. It's yeah, just yeah. mad, it was crazy, you know. <laughs> I've realised, you know, it's time for me... I've got no chance with Julia Sawala, yeah. but it's time for me to find a serious partner I've got a real hope of making a go of it oh, that's with. That's really you good, know. Rich. You've, you know, you've really, uh, you've really grown up and matured over the last six weeks, you have. Yeah, well, and the police have become involved. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyway, earlier on, we met the girl who smelled of spam. <laughs> but now it's time to meet the man who smells of human feces. <laughs> Would you please welcome him, Peter? <laughs> Hello, um, I'm back with my final set of exciting lifestyle ideas. <laughs> By the way, can I just say to all the people who've written in to say that I'm the saddest man they've ever seen, <laughs> I'm actually quite happy, but thank you for your concern anyway. <laughs> right, well, it's the end of the series, and so time for a party. And according to Richard and Stuart, I've been so good, I can have my own special party in my bed sit on my own. <laughs> so why not imagine that your eyes are some legs and you're going to walk through the television screen into Peter's happy party? <laughs> 
This is a balloon I made by pushing a coat hanger into the ball cock from the toilet system. <laughs> Floating, look. <laughs> These are some fruit gums here that I've stuck on a length of string. Fairy lights. <laughs> you can make them flash, look. <laughs> and then later on, I'm going to be having an indoor firework display. If you want to try this, what you do is just go and get the uh, lawn sprinkler that you found in a skip in Elmfield Road, <laughs> nail it to the wall, then connect it by a hose to the gas supply. <laughs> then light the end. <laughs> Catherine wheels. <clears throat> right, party recipes next, and why not try this tasty treat? Get a pasty that you've sucked all the sort of guts out of. <laughs> fill it with Cadbury smash. Jacket potatoes. <laughs> next up, what party is complete without guests? Well, mine. <laughs> Obviously. However, you don't have to rely on just people for company. I think I'll invite Donny Oddlegs, my dead friend. <laughs> there he is. Hello, Donny. I'm glad you could make it. Oh, look, he's brought a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sit down there, help yourself to dips. <laughs> it's a nice dip you might like to try making, actually. You just get a tub of flora and take the lid off. <laughs> mm. Delicious, that. <laughs> right, finally, one of the other really good things that people do at parties is meet ladies, apparently. <laughs> That's the lady I'm going to be meeting there. <laughs> <clears throat> That's her eyes there. That's her tongue, made from a bit of bacon. <laughs> That spot, I'm going to imagine, is one of her nice earrings. <laughs> That's the hair that they have there. That came off me from down there in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> nice, isn't it? And uh, what I'm going to do later on is I'm going to switch the light off and go and stand in the corner and kiss her, like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that her tongue. <laughs> I suppose that's like French kissing, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Just a fun. He's going to shoot a good many more baskets before he's full grown. Well, back in 1840, when Roland Hill invented the postal system, he never guessed it'd be used to send such rubbish as all this stuff up here. <laughs> so join us now, the giant worms that wriggle along the corridor we call the imagination, <laughs> as we take this week's visit to the, the gallery. gallery. Kirsty Cameron sent this in. It's the Andrex puppy. But look, he's in the oven. <laughs> That's a shame. This is a leaflet I found in Cardiff advertising a pizza restaurant that's been endorsed by Brian Conley. <laughs> <laughs> it's Brian Conley's favourite pizza shop. And here he is in three different disguises enjoying three different types <laughs> of pizza. <laughs> This is uh, something I've personally collected. This is my own collection of signed photos of BBC Radio Cambridge DJ Christopher South. <laughs> now, it's my belief that this is the largest collection of signed photos of Christopher South in existence. Well, in, in as much as uh, there is more than one. Yeah, there and uh, one unless you know different, let us know. Look at his... Uh, what I like about Christopher, though, is his Cornish curmudgeonly face there. <laughs> Epitomising the word Cornish there, really. <laughs> oh, and this is from Emily. This is the molecule of benzene-1,3-dicarboxylic acid. Uh, but look, where the C's are put, she's put celebrities whose names begin with C. There, that's <laughs> very clever. This, of course, is Derek Thompson, but he does play Charlie in Casualty, so it's allowed. <laughs> this here is uh, from Michael Denman in Kent. It's some athlete's foot cream with talcum powder that's been sprinkled onto a piece of paper. And in the corner here, Mike's written, it stinks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that, Mike. Thanks for sending it in. Yeah, and um, <laughs> thanks for all the stuff you sent in over the series. We really did enjoy looking at it, and I'm sorry uh, if yours wasn't displayed, but do keep it coming in while we're off air so that we can copy your ideas and make money ourselves from them. <laughs> I like Fist of Fun. Will you hurry up, please? <laughs>
Yes, I do love you, Rich. I love you too, Lady that, Diana. That's, um, that's Lady Diana from the royal family that you're putting up on your Julia yeah. Suarez shrine now, Rich. Yeah, yeah. she's. I, mean, I love her, Stu. She's my. I'm a number one fan because <coughs> I was at Wimbledon last year and I was lucky to have seats very near to the royal box, or to give her her official title, the Princess of Wales, mm. and uh, <laughs> she's. <laughs> Gorgeous, it's stupid though what, what you've done because you said you were going to take Julia Sawala down and replace her with someone you got a realistic chance of going out with. Well, Lady Di's single now, isn't she? Oh, no, so that's not the, you know, <laughs> she's in the royal family. You won't get near. Oh God, yeah, I'm less chance of that. Yeah, I'm less. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wasn't thinking. I think I don't understand about royal family. We're all splitting up, you know, uh, Charles and Di splitting up, Andy and Fergie splitting up. The real question for me there is who's going to get custody of the children? Well, I think that singers we've paid for them. <laughs> Perhaps they could be shared out on a kind of rotor system. Um, a bit like the school hamster. <laughs> it's, um, it's been great, hasn't it? We're nearly at the end of the series yeah. now, Stu. It's been great being on the telly, hasn't it? What are we going to get up to next, the two of us, the old well, two musketeers? Yeah, what no, should we I've, do I've next? Been hey, I've, hey. I've been thinking about hey. this. Shut up, right? <laughs> I've been thinking about this, Richard, and I actually I, I don't want to do anything with you again, ever. Um, <laughs> It's just that, in essence, I, I am better than you. I have better ideas, but you sort of just spoil them by just, you know, looning around. I mean, I'm not saying you're not talented. I think you could probably do, like, a daytime quiz show or something, or children's TV. <laughs> or maybe if in the future there was some kind of new channel that just made programmes just for chimps and monkeys. <laughs> you could do that sort of chimp-based thing. Or if the chimps thing doesn't come off, then regional broadcasting in Somerset, that would be something <laughs> you could move into that. Yeah. No, thanks. That's really good. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, the, over the last six weeks, though, Stu, we've been trying to find ways to fill up time, haven't yeah, we? Yeah. And uh, I've been actually... I've been reading this book this week. It's Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, uh, which, even at only 220 pages, still wasn't nearly brief enough for me, mm. I must say. Uh, <laughs> What's good, though? We did enjoy the chapter on uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. That was good. Yeah, and it did seem relevant to our quest about finding ways to fill up time, cos apparently uh, Einstein's first theory of relativity states that time moves more slowly if you spend it with your relatives. <laughs> and Einstein's second theory of relativity says, oh, doesn't the, the minutes fly by when you're having fun, don't they? When you enjoy yourself. <laughs> it goes like the wind. So, we decided to put this to the test, didn't we, Stu? That's right. I went out this week to try and have as good a time as humanly possible. And I went to the annual family gathering at my grand's in Middlesbrough. Squash, David. Richard, Gran. Yes. Could I have coffee this time, please, Gran? Yes. Here's your lemon squash, David. Nice and meek. Thank you, Gran. I'm at the London Fetish Club Fantasy Toilet. Where I'm going to take some of the mind bending sex drug ecstasy. There it is. Try and find out if he really does it. Cool. Now, this slide is that slide, which is the slide of me and your Auntie Jean on holiday in Newquay wearing hats. Yes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> now, this slide is that slide, which is the slide of me and your Auntie Jean again, still on holiday in Newquay, but look, I'm not wearing a hat now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding it in my hand. Stop do you know what the rudest word ever is? No, Andrew, I don't. It is boobies and bum. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seemed to me that my day with the family had lasted eight or nine months. <laughs> but on leaving the house, I found that earth clocks had moved forward only four minutes. <laughs> Whereas my day seemed to be over in a quarter of an hour. Although later on, a medical examination of my heart, liver, lungs, kidneys and sexual reproductive organs showed that I had aged over 20 years. So... <laughs> Einstein was right there, you see. Well done, Einstein. Keep up the good work, mate. Fun. Look at that. 
Oh, well, yes, this type of meal's in an entirely different league. Well, it's the end of the series now. Time to clear up. It's been uh, quite good fun, but obviously there have been the usual sort of letdown. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey! Oh, oh it's uh, Ant and Deck again. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Cancel on, Deck. Cancel on. Cancel on. Cancel on. Cancel on. Cancel on. Cancel on. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to hide him here. They're going after you. Quick, in there. Quick, in there. In there. They went that way. Get down that well there. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, rich, rich. And now you're rich. mine. <laughs> Told you. What? They're called Ant and Deck now, not PJ and Duncan. It's oh, yeah, so I love you, Ant and Deck. All right? Yeah, OK. Yeah. That is the end of the series. Um, thanks oh, for... Hold on. Pete, Pete, what do you think you're doing, mate? Pete, what do you think you're doing there? Oh, sorry, I was going to bed. No, no, Pete, this place has to, this has to be all cleared out now. It's the end of the series. Come on, out you go. Uh, come on, lads, come on down. What? All this stuff has to be smashed to pieces, Pete. Uh, the BBC can't afford to store no, it or anything. But I thought on, I could live go, here. Lads. I mean, I'd be kicked out of my bed shit and everything, Rich. Sorry, Pete, you know, it has to be smashed. And that T-shirt, Pete, that T-shirt belongs to the BBC, doesn't it? Give it back. <laughs> Smash it all up, lads. That's off you go, Pete. Goodbye. Go on. Bye-bye. Off you go. Anyway, um... See go on. Get out of it. That's the end, and uh, yeah. now it's time for us to get back into our crate. What, just, there's just one crate here? Yeah, it's just one crate now. There's nothing funny about it, it's just due so to sort of cuts. I just came back for Donny Odd Legs. Look, get Donny lost, go, go, go away. <laughs> no, not R, oh, actually, so shut up. All right, get back in no. your crate. Come All on, right, we'll there. get back in till, uh, yeah. when we're next need required. Oh, thanks a lot for watching. <laughs> See you then. See you next time, Bye. probably. Bye. <laughs> Fifty-fifty, half of it was very nice.